My name is Dave Gandhi. Dave. Okay. okay. Yeah, got it. Just want to just before we start the meeting, uh, judge is asking us to have a few mem moments of private time. Can I excuse the rest of you for the oh. public members? Oh no, everyone can stay. I'd okay. like to speak for a moment just to the panel. Judge, yes, it's yours. Good morning. Uh, we're just we're going to not yet be on the record. I'd like to just speak with the panel members for a moment about our procedure. If we can just talk for a moment. We're off the record. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'd already spoken. Oh. Panel B, meeting to the order. I cannot hear. Sorry. Microphones are not. I think it's ready now. Okay. We're on, right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is Panel B meeting, uh, Medical Board of California. Uh, roll call, please. Here. 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 I'm so sorry. I can't hear you. Oh. Use the microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Morning. Dr. Krause? Here. Dr. Levine? Here. Ms. Pines? Here. Ms. Shipsky? Mr. Tagami? Dr. Ganadev? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Levine. I think our first order of business is to elect a chair and vice chair for panel B, and I'd like to nominate Dr. Gananadev as chair and Ms. Pines as vice chair of panel B. I Second. guess. Any objections? Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you. I appreciate it. I'm trying to bring up my first order of business. Oral argument? Is it now for me? My turn? Yes. All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Beth Faber Jacobs. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. And we are, I'm going to now call the cases for oral argument. We are here for oral argument in the board's non-adoption in the first amended accusation against Robert Markman, MD. It's medical board case number 17, 2011, 214399. I've been assigned to sit with the board for this proceeding and preside over today's matter. Today is Thursday, October 24th, 2013. It's about 8.40. May I have the appearances starting with counsel for complainant? Yes, Clint James McKay from the Attorney General's Office for complainant. Good morning, Mr. McKay. And Dr. Markman, you're representing yourself in this proceeding? Yes. All right, sir. Before we begin, there's some information that I'd like to give regarding my background and my role in this proceeding. As you know, Mr. McKay is in the Attorney General's Office. 
I worked in the atten Attorney General's office for many years, and for a number of those years, I was in the Health Quality Enforcement section and knew Mr. McKay, although we were in different cities. I have not spoken to anyone in the Attorney General's office concerning this matter, and I have not spoken to the board concerning this matter, and in fact, I have not met the panel members uh, at all until this morning. I have a very limited role in today's proceeding. I am not the decision maker. The board will be making the decision. But there may be some legal issues that I will be called upon to rule on. I believe I can be fair and impartial and provide a fair process to both parties. But I wanted to give you this information before we proceeded. Are we ready to proceed? Yes, we are. All right. As you've previously been advised, each party will have 15 minutes to present your oral argument, and then each will have five minutes for rebuttal. Uh, Dr. Markman, when a person who's not represented makes an appearance before the board, we usually swear them in. So at this time, I'd like you to stand, and I will give you the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear, under penalty of perjury, that the argument you'll be giving in this proceeding today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you, sir. You may be seated. And normally we start with uh, the licensee. And Dr. Markman, would you like me to give you a few minutes notice before the 15 minutes are up? No, I have a, a timer right here. All right, and if you'll give me one moment. You may begin. First, I want to thank you for uh, stopping the insanity. This is an unprecedented case. My daughter has been battling pain for 19 years, almost half of her life. Before I started treating her myself, I pursued all possible treatment options. It was only after every intervention failed that I began to administer propofol to her. Expert physicians from every conceivable specialty have attempted to help her, but the results have been disastrous. She was hospitalized in 2008 for acute hepatorenal failure following the embolization of her ovarian veins. In 2009, she developed a severe MRSA cellulitis and abscess following the implantation of a sacral nerve stimulator, and that complication kept her bedridden for almost a year. Since 2010, she has been bedridden as a result of the permanent damage done to her sacral nerve roots and pudendal nerves as a result of the overzealous use of radiofrequency treatment. These last two complications were not only iatrogenic, they were a direct result of the negligence of two internationally renowned experts, Dr. Shlomo Raz, urologist at UCLA, and Dr. Sheldon Jordan, neurologist and pain specialist, also from UCLA. As a result of these medical misadventures, four years ago, my daughter became almost completely bedridden to the extent that even the slightest movement in her bed caused excruciating pain. You've seen the video. I have stills here for you, if, if for anyone who hasn't seen the video. Um, would anyone like to see the stills from the video? Any panel members like to see? No, thank you. Okay. Out of necessity, I came up with an innovative way to relieve my daughter's suffering. After studying the laws that govern the practice of medicine in California, and after consulting with the DEA, I found that I could administer propofol to my daughter in my home without violating any state or federal statutes. Then I developed a protocol guaranteeing my daughter's safety, and the propofol turned out to be amazingly effective as a form of palliative treatment. It worked so well that I submitted an abstract to the journal Anesthesia and Analgesia describing my results so that other anesthesiologists interested in helping patients with intractable, intractable pain could learn from my experience. It worked so well that my daughter's life became bearable. When she had access to propofol, she had a life and she had hope. She was able to take a flight to New York and spend a weekend at a Lyme disease conference. 
She was able to leave the house and take a 12-hour round trip with me to Stanford's pain clinic and three separate six-hour round trips with me to see Dr. Goldstein in San Diego. Since the medical board took the propofol away, her life has been unbearable. She gets out of bed only to sit on the toilet for hours, and now it's a struggle for her to make the 15-minute trip to her pain doctor in Encino once a month. Nineteen months ago, in one stroke, the medical board suspended my license and publicized worldwide what it had done. I was instantly vilified as the next Conrad Murray stopped just in time. The world was put on notice that the state of California was not going to tolerate the use of propofol, the drug that killed Michael Jackson for anything but anesthesia or sedation in licensed facilities. No matter that it had been safely administered to over a billion patients, 15,000 of them my own patients. No matter that I had developed a way to administer propofol at home that is safer than hospital administration. No matter that is the only treatment that allows my daughter to have some quality of life. I was declared an imminent danger to my daughter and she has suffered from that decision for 19 months. What the board has done is to severely harm my daughter in the guise of protecting her from the infinitesimally small chance that I might harm her. The concept that the medical board can itself cause unlimited harm in order to prevent the possibility of harm is a perverse concept. The harm done by this medical board is not just physical harm, and it's not just harm to my daughter. If I hadn't been interrupted by the medical board, the abstract I submitted for publication on propofol would have been revised and published by now and my findings duplicated by other physicians. It's no accident that two days after I sent a letter to Linda Whitney calling into question the integrity of the medical board investigation, that two detectives from the LAPD sexual assault unit arrived at my house demanding that I wake my bedridden daughter up and drag her outside. When I refused, they yanked me off my porch, threw me to the ground, punched me in the face, arrested me and charged me with assaulting a police officer and delaying a police officer. This was all engineered by Mr. McKay. Those two LAPD detectives were sent by Mr. McKay. Even though I was acquitted of assault after a jury trial, it hasn't stopped Mr. McKay from repeatedly to this day claiming that I attacked and injured two police officers. If you dig deep enough into the record, this is obvious. During the interim suspension order hearing, Mr. McKay repeatedly told Judge Juarez that Dr. he- Dr. Markman, this, this, your argument needs to be about the decision. I wish you wouldn't interrupt me because I've watched these hearings and the interruption, there were no interruptions. Uh, a, one, of the district one of the attorneys representing the state made some remarks that were not uh, part of the record and the uh, ALJ who was presiding waited till the end in both instances and then said, well, this will not be on the record. So I wish you could do it that way. I'd appreciate it. I'm going to, this will apply to both you and to Mr. McKay. Okay. Um, Mr. McKay asked, this, this, this is relevant and you won't see unless you let me, uh, you know, complete a couple more sentences. That's why, that's why I, I wish you wouldn't interrupt me. You may complete a few more sentences, but I encourage you to stick to the the propriety of the decision and to what oral argument is supposed to address today. I am sticking to it, but you're not letting me uh, even. You may continue. I mean, you stopped me way too soon. Oh, you're I'm not sorry. stopped. You may continue, well, sir. You're taking away my time, and I don't appreciate that either. It's I 15 will... minutes. It's really hard to say what I want to say in 15 minutes. At the interim suspension order hearing, Mr. McKay repeatedly asked Judge Juarez to issue an, issue an order so that he could have my daughter forcibly removed from my house. But Juarez didn't make that order. That didn't stop McKay. My daughter will never recover from the trauma of the police first coming to take me away and then coming back three months later to take her away. She'll suffer from severe PTSD until the day she dies. She has suffered tremendous physical and emotional harm as a result of this abuse of power. Mr. McKay, of course, denies he was responsible for this attempted abduction of my daughter. But once you, again, if you dig deep enough, the evidence is in the record is clear. 
Mr. McKay's arguments to this panel rely on allegations that have all been proven false at the hearings. His tactic of repeating lies until they become facts may work well with poorly trained judges who have no business deciding medical issues, but I'm confident that this <coughs> panel will see through them. The state, the state did not show that it is safer for my daughter to be treated in a licensed facility than to be treated by me with no backup in my home. It actually inadvertently convincingly proved just the opposite. I watched with great interest your last meeting where Deputy Attorney, the, the Deputy Eternal, Attorney General argued against allowing Dr. Ryan Peterson to return to practice as an anesthesiologist because the oversight at surgery centers would likely not prevent an operating table death. Sir, let's talk about if you could restrict your argument to your case. I will uh, give you a, a little extra time for these interruptions, but please direct your argument to the case, to the decision that is before the board now. This is part of my argument. If you let, give me a chance, you would see it. Dr. Peterson, a meth addict for 13 years, was injecting himself with fentanyl and propofol undetected while providing anesthesia in licensed facilities. How many patients did he put in danger despite practicing in licensed facilities? Uh, the medical board is making a big deal of the fact that I d didn't provide the propofol at a licensed facility. The oversight at licensed facilities admitted by your own, by one of the medical board's own uh, um, deputy attorney generals at the last hearing that some of you were at, uh, uh, argued that there, the oversight at these facilities is not going to prevent a death. The risk of, my, of harm to my, to my daughter from being treated at surgery centers or hospitals has been empirically proven more than once to be much greater than the risk of me treating my daughter at home. At home, she doesn't have to worry about drug-addicted anesthesiologists or nurses' mistakes or the infections like the MRSA infection that she got and that are common in hospitals. More than anyone, my daughter understands the risks of being treated by the experts in their licensed facilities. At this point, she would rather die than live the way she is living, and she has vowed never to return to a hospital again. She would like you to accept that unless a miracle cure comes along very soon that sh she is dying, and all she wants at this point is for the medical board to allow her to receive the care she chooses. My daughter and other patients who suffer from persistent genital arousal disorder have said that they would rather have cancer than the persistent genital arousal disorder because at least cancer has an end. Although Lisa has told me that she would never consider suicide, she also has told me many times to give up on her, that in fact, after battling pain for half her life, she would welcome death. Dr. Schaefer wrote a letter to Judge Formaker 19 months ago stating, quote, this misrepresentation by Mr. McKay is so offensive that in my view, Mr. McKay should be barred from further future representation of the Department of Justice for the State of California. Mr. McKay has demonstrated an utter disregard for honest representation of the interests of the state. I am shocked, disappointed, and frankly disgusted that Mr. McKay, representing the Department of Justice, has chosen to repeatedly misrepresent the facts and distort the care and the intent of Dr. Markman. Dr. Markman, this is not about the Deputy Attorney General. This please proceed with argument regarding your matter. The Deputy Attorney General produced fantasy instead of facts, and that is about, uh, it's up to you to, to decide whether it was fantasy or facts, so I don't see why that shouldn't be part of my argument. I didn't ask Dr. Schaefer to write that amicus brief. He insisted on writing it because he strongly believes that what the medical board is doing is wrong. Mr. McKay wrote that the panel should disregard the purport, what he calls the purported amicus brief, he claims there's no provision in the board hearings for testimony and arguments by third parties with no interest in the matter. Really, Mr. McKay, why does McKay pretend that Code Section 1364.31a doesn't exist? And I'll quote it here. A non-party with an interest in the outcome of an administrative hearing may be permitted to file an amicus curiae brief when a panel 
has not adopted a decision. McKay presents this doesn't, pretends this doesn't exist because Dr. Schaefer's amicus brief is devastating to the medical board's case against me. Mr. McKay repeatedly makes false statements to conflate facts with fantasy, like the following list of completely false statements, and, he, uh, and these are quotes from him. He attacked a social worker. He attacked two policemen. He injured a police detective. He physically fought with police who were attempting to monitor him. He attacked an adult protective service investigator. He was injecting drugs into her clitoris and labia. The house is entirely filthy with rotting food in the treatment area. There are blow-ups of Lisa's genitalia tacked to the wall around respondent's workplace. What I have here is the only genitalia, picture of genitalia that was ever tacked on any of my walls. And as you can see, it's a picture of my daughter fully clothed with her dog's penis showing. Those are the genitalia that he claims were my daughter's genitalia. Sir, if you can please take the picture back to the table. My daughter uh, wanted to be here, so uh, uh, she could be sitting in the audience, but I brought a picture. That is not evidence that we are relying upon in this proceeding. Please restrict your comments to the record. And for the record, the comments regarding Mr. McKay are not the evidence in this proceeding. Your time is almost up. I will, as I said, I would give you an additional minute for the interruptions. That minute is now beginning. Here are more lies by Mr. McKay. My, his daughter has a long history of drug use and mental illness. He has utterly failed to consult with pain specialists. He didn't allow his daughter to be treated at Stanford. These statements are all 100% untrue. There is no evidence of any kind that, uh, of, for any of these things that were produced at the hearing. McKay's written argument consists of 14 lies and seven pages. His reply brief consists of 26 lies and four pages. His most malicious lie is, nonetheless, without corroboration, respondent himself diagnosed his daughter with persistent genital arousal disorder. That is so untrue. I, she was diagnosed by uh, Dr. Berman at UCLA originally, and that diagnosis was confirmed by Dr. Glazer, Dr. Raz, and Dr. Goldstein, who has been treating her. For him to make a statement that I diagnosed myself that disease so that he could uh, keep his narrative that I'm some kind of uh, pedophile pervert who's locked his daughter up in his, her, his room so he could examine her genitals is malicious. It's just malicious, malicious, and he should not be representing the state of California. Dr. Schaefer is an esteemed professor at Stanford and Columbia, and he is so enraged by what he saw and the way Di uh, Mr. McKay performed that he, on his own, wrote that amicus. I didn't ask him to. Dr. Markman, your time has concluded. You'll have five minutes to do your, your closing argument at the after uh, Mr. McKay has his argument. Thank you. Mr. McKay. Thank you. Let's, let's start by talking about just what we know. What happened here is that Dr. Markman took his daughter to Cedar sinai and told them the treatment that he was administering to his daughter. They were so concerned about it, they reported him to the medical board. That's how this began. In the course of that investigation, Investigator Hollis and I went out to the house and personally, I walked in, Investor Hollis walked in, saw, smelled the place, saw dog feces, saw all of this, all of this going on, interviewed his daughter. I was present, Investigator Hollis was present, we interviewed his daughter who was in a room, cluttered, you can't even move in the room, sitting in a bed, he then, Dr. Markman, then escorted us to his treatment room, which is in his bedroom. His bed, then a treatment gurney with little fuzzy slippers on it, not making this up, where he treats his daughter. In that room is an array of different equipment, an array of different drugs, some of which have been expired 15 years. He has created a treatment, basically a surgery room, you know, administration room, if you will, in his bedroom. 
the equipment which is in there, some of it has been accumulated by him, some of it has been built by him, including a cigar box that has two little holes cut in it to prevent his daughter from increasing the propofol dose while she's getting these treatments, which he brought to trial and showed to the judge. We know then that at trial we brought in four experts, one of whom, Sean Mackey, is an undisputed expert in pain management worldwide. Even Dr. Markman's expert, Dr. Schaefer, conceded that Dr. Mackey is a preeminent pain management person. By the way, Dr. Markman is not. He's an anesthesiologist. He may have administered propofol. He is not a pain management person. When we inspected the house, by the way, Investigator Hollis testified, and I personally also saw, pictures of his daughter's genitalia on his desk. She testified to that at the hearing. I put that testimony in my brief. You can read that. That's what we saw. It's undisputed that he, is, that he examined his daughter's genitalia multiple times, purportedly in the course of treatment. We went through, brought in four experts, had them review it. Dr. Mackey, as I said in my brief, indicated that the treatment that Dr. Markman was administering to his daughter was multiple standard deviations from the practice of medicine in California, the proper practice of medicine in California. Dr. Verdelin, Dr. Macbeth, Dr. Penhall, we had four experts talk about these issues. What he is doing here is he's experimenting on his daughter. If we take for, just take as fact, that what's going on here is some innovative treatment which he himself has developed, that he himself is the only one, he's the smartest man in the room, he's the only one who has seen that this will in fact act as an analgesic for his daughter's pain. If we take that at given fact, what he's doing is experimenting in his daughter in his bedroom of his house. Now, an adult protective services worker went out to the house to make sure she was okay. He chased her into his car. Okay, she had to lock up the windows. Thereafter, two officers come to the house. They try to see her. They end up in a scuffle. He ends up being convicted of interfering with a police officer and does time in jail for that little activity. This is not the practice of medicine. Okay, this is not the standard of care in California. Now, with respect to Judge Cohen, the decision which he administered, which he proposed decision, provides for probation and for a monitor, but to allow the treatments to continue in his house. Now, you yourself have now heard his, the degree to which he respects the medical board. You have heard the degree to which he believes that he is right in this situation. How much do you think he will cooperate with a monitor that will be placed in his house? This is going to be a game of cat and mouse. A monitor will be appointed, probably, if it's an independent monitor, he will try to do his job. If it's a friendly monitor, friendly to Dr. Martin, there will be no monitoring as such. In either event, what will happen here is that the treatments will continue. He will begin to administer propofol, which, as we know, is a dangerous drug. He already acknowledges that he's given it to her 500 times. 500 times he administered propofol in his bedroom on the gurney with the fuzzy slippers. This in itself, aside from the expired drugs, aside from the cigar box with holes cut in it, aside from the, from the filth that was in his house, and by the way, he apparently did clean it up when his experts inspected it did clean up his house, so when his experts came out there, it was clean. When the investigator and I went out there, it was not. Okay. So we can imagine the normal condition of this place. Okay. But nonetheless, the monitor that Judge Cohen proposes is simply not going to work either way. It's either going to be a friendly monitor, in which case Dr. Marmon will get no monitoring, or it's going to be a truly objective monitor in which case, he's going to fight him every inch of the way. Everything he can do, he will do. There's no doubt. There can be no doubt watching this man, the way he talks, that he's not going to cooperate with a probation monitor. He's not going to cooperate with a practice monitor. It's not going to happen in real life. 
Now, there was an argument that Dr. Markman was supposedly the physician of last resort. But in fact, Dr. Mackey indicated that she could be evaluated and treated at Stanford Payne, which was one of the foremost clinics in the country. Now, one of the things they said they would do there was they would clean her out. They'd stop her drugs. They would try to diagnose what, in fact, was going on with her, rather than having her father trail around behind her to all these different doctors and trying to manage, trying to interfere, trying to control her treatment. They would close all of that off, clean her out, and let's see what we got. Makes sense. We don't do it at Stanford pain. We could do it at UCLA. We could do it. There are a number of different excellent pain management clinics in this country. None of that is going to happen as long as this man is allowed to continue to treat her. That's the truth. Because he is the smartest man in the room, as you have heard. Now, in this situation, you have a woman who has had been at least 150, 150 hold, has a variety of physical illnesses we don't know because we've never actually had an independent assessment done by a, by a pain management clinic such as Stanford, what the interaction is between the various drugs and the physical ailments that have actually be, pre, pre, preceded the, this whole onset of all of these different treatments and stuff, and which were caused by the treatments, we have no idea because there's going to have to be a full evaluation, which the two of them will not allow. They're not going to allow that to happen. They didn't go back to Stanford, okay? They're not going to go back to Stanford. What's going to happen here, and I'm sorry, my phone went off, so I don't know how much time I have. How much time do you I have? You have about six and a half minutes. Okay. What's going, to, what's, what's going to happen here is that things are going to proceed the way that they have proceeded. Now, Dr. Mackey, when he, I, I put in my brief some of, the, of the, his comments regarding these treatments. Dr. Verdelin, Dr. Macbeth, and Dr. Penhallow were saying the same thing, okay? The only expert, pain management expert, who testified about the, the use of propofol and, and all of this analgesic stuff was Dr. Schaefer. Now, I have no idea what the relationship is between Dr. Schaefer and Dr. Markman. Apparently, he submitted a paper to him. He's trying to get him published or whatever it is. But there seems to be some type of relationship there where somehow Dr. Schaefer has bought into these arguments. But every other physician, every other physician who has looked at this situation is appalled. I mean, it's not surprising. I mean, excuse me, but it's not brain surgery, right? Some of you may be brain surgeons. I apologize if, I, if I'm saying that. But I'm just saying that what happens here is just taking a look at what we know which is that you have a father treating a daughter and contending that he is objective. Now, if you take him at his word and you say that this young woman, and she's 37 now or so, is suffering from unbelievable pain, just take that as a given. I don't know of any parent who could be objective, could objectively decide, oh, here's the best treatment plan for this person when in the next room this person is in pain, is in agony, is making howling and, and, and saying, I, I can't stand it. I don't want to live anymore. It, it's absurd to contemplate. It's absurd to think that this man can objectively treat his daughter. Then you move on to the fact that he's treating her in his house, in his bedroom. You go on to the fact that he's examining her genitalia. You go on to the fact that, that, there are, that the place is dirty. You go on to the fact that there's no independent, independent oversight of any of these treatments. That it is far outside, not just outside, not just, well, let's just talk about it, far outside any kind of current practice, current treatment that is acknowledged in the medical community. Now, in the event that propofol down the road is found to be an analgesic, an effective analgesic, that kind of treatment will be given in a hospital where there are nurses, 
where there are people who oversee the situation where there are backup in the event something goes wrong. We know what happens when propofol is administered and there is no one at home or there something goes wrong. We know this. Okay? This situation is so far out of anything that should be permitted by the medical board that it, it, it's almost beyond argument, but apparently it's not. Judge Cohen's primary fault, in my view, is being too optimistic. He felt that somehow this could be managed. I'm telling you it can't be managed. I'm telling you that there's no way that this man will allow it to be managed because he is the one who knows best. That is the, that is the situation. With respect to PGAD, whoever diagnosed it, understand there are only 22 diagnosed cases in the history of recorded medicine. 22. Whole world. 22 cases. But, he's, but apparently there's one here in Los Angeles now. I, if that's true, there's even one more reason why this young woman needs to be seen by a multidisciplinary team who can evaluate her for drugs, for physical damage, physical ailments, for this syndrome, which apparently there's some feeling she might have. That's what's required here. You have two minutes Not, left, sir. Thank you. Not treating her by her father in his bedroom next to his bed in a house which Investigator Howells testified at the hearing is filthy. This is not modern medicine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Markman, uh, you have five minute rebuttal. Would you like to uh, do your rebuttal? Yes. All right. The only uh, fuzzy uh, thing, and there were no fuzzy slippers, is the Mr. McKay's fuzzy logic. There's, and uh, as far as the feces, the only feces is what's coming out of Mr. McKay's mouth. There's never any dog feces in my house. That is just, as everything else he said, a lie. He, can see, he has a, a gift to sit here and look you in, straight in the face and lie. And if you have read, and I hope you have, my 47-page written argument that cites every fact and every lie, then you'll know that he's lying. But if you go ahead and check anything he says, with the record, you'll find out that everything's a lie. I did know jail time. That I, didn't, I don't have a cigar box. I have a safe. It's, I bought a safe and cut holes in it so the two, IV tube can go through it. This idea that there's 22 cases of PGAD in the history of the world is nonsense. If you look at the, his fav, Mr. McKay's favorite reference, Wikipedia, it says there are 7,000 cases worldwide. Um, the problem with Mr. McKay's experts is PGAD is not a pain disorder. It's a disorder of constant arousal, arousal that is, is not relieved by orgasm ever. It's like having, my daughter's been, been in a state of constant arousal for the last seven years. And it is not pain, it's something that cannot be, uh, 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 it's, it's just different enough that pain physicians, pain specialists have no idea what to do. No, no pain physicians ha have ever written anything about PGAD. There are other doctors that have. There's obstetricians, gynecologists, there's surgeons, there's a Dr. Goldstein who's seen my daughter three or four times and has actually taught me how to do pudendal blocks on her because he has his own technique and he understood that she is bedridden and can't keep going back and forth to, to uh, San Diego. He understood that it made sense for me to give her pudendal blocks in my house. And he, he un and um, this idea that she purportedly has it is nonsense. I listed five doctors that have diagnosed it. Um, 
And this idea that Mackey, Dr. Mackey, that my daughter and I have not gone to, back to Dr. Mackey for a full evaluation. Look at the chart. Look at the second time we went there. She was fully evaluated. His whole, uh, his whole story is just full of holes. There's nothing but holes. Doc, we went back to, Dr. to Stanford a second time. My daughter was fully evaluated by Dr. Mackey and she is following all of his, of his suggestions. Unfortunately, he doesn't have any magic medicine, and he doesn't have any, if you look at uh, Exhibit 5201, I believe, that's a second visit, that's a full evalu evaluation by him. And aside from that, Dr. Mackey, if you, qu I can qu quote his first impression was that, I, I am not, he said that Dr. Markman as far as I can tell, is not putting his daughter in any danger. And that is, he wrote that. Everything that Mr. McKay, I can't stress this enough, is a lie. If you read the 47 page written argument I made, you'll, you'd know that. If you haven't read the, the, um, the case, then you, how do you know what's true? If you've actually read it, and, and we have been diligent in it, and I trust you have been, and read Dr. Schaefer's amicus brief, then you know that this guy is a fraud. He's a total fraud. He should not be sitting here in front of you. He's a disgrace. And, and you should not have lay judges and lay attorneys deciding cases that involve medical testimony that they cannot understand. You mean to wrap up your argument now, sir? So I'm not interested in uh, you deciding that I need to be, uh, have some kind of discipline. I'm interested in getting my license back without any restriction so I can take care of my dying daughter without any further interference from you. You've done it, I'm, I don't mean you. Let me say this, Mr. McKay has disdain for all of you because he just comes up here and lies. I have, I highly respect this panel because you have, made, uh, uh, you realize there's something wrong with Judge Cohn's decision. So I highly respect that you did that and you took the time to, hopefully you took the time to read over the record and you realize what's going on here. My daughter needs my care. I am the doctor of last resort. Everyone else has given up on her. Every treatment has been tried. He keeps talking about Dr. Mackey. Dr. Mackey, Dr. Mackey is, has, has nothing to offer. Thank you for your argument. Mr. McKay, rebuttal. Thank you. you may proceed. Thank you. The fact of the matter is, is if anything has been de demonstrated here today, it's that he has no objectivity. He has none. He, whatever treatment there might be, however many you know, different therapies have been tried, he has no ability to assess the true nature of his daughter's illness, illness, ailments, what a treatment is appropriate, and to administer that treatment. If this man has his license back, he will do exactly what he wants to do. Make no mistake, he will. And that is because he believes that what he is doing is right. And he doesn't believe that anyone else has the right to tell him differently. He thinks that he has gone through all of this stuff and he knows. It is important that that be seen as the seminal point here, is that whatever you say to him, if you allow him to practice medicine, he will do exactly what he wants to do. Monitoring isn't going to help. Probation isn't going to help. Nothing will help other than revocation. That's the only thing that will solve this problem. This is mental illness. This is an interlocking mental illness. This is not medicine. And there's nothing that you're going to do that's going to be able to control it other than revoking his license. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This at this time, the matter will be submitted. The board will go be going into closed session. We thank everyone. Excuse me, doctor. Uh, just I wanted to see if any oh. panel members have any questions to Dr. Mark, Markman or Mr. McKay. Thank you. Are there any questions from any of the panel members? Yes, yeah, Dr. Uh, Levine. Dr. Markman, just to, to be clear, at the time your license was suspended, 
Um, what, what treatments, were there any treatments beside the propofol that were being administered by you to your daughter? Yes, I was doing um, clitoral nerve blocks and pudendal nerve blocks. And how often? Uh, they were being, well, it is complicated because I, they were effective. The blocks were effective for about up to two weeks at a time until Dr. Jordan started doing his radio frequency. I, in fact, I took her to Dr. Jordan so that he could do something that would last longer than uh, Marcane blocks because I was getting a week to two weeks out of them. He said he could get six months uh, by treating her pudendal nerves, he would be able to block her discomfort for six months. But that didn't, didn't work that way. The first time he did it, it blocked it for 10 days, and then it came back worse than ever, and he, he did it six times, way too many times. As Dr. Mackey testified, it's, it's, it, it was uh, negligent, and it was malpractice, really. But he, every time he did it, she would get relief for a shorter and shorter period of time, and my blocks became less and less effective until I finally stopped doing them because when after he'd done the, the RF, the radio frequency uh, treatments six or seven times and she was in much worse pain than before I had ever taken her there, she, uh, my blocks didn't work anymore. He had, whatever he'd done to the pudendal nerve, it, my blocks wouldn't work anymore and I stopped doing them. So, so you had stopped doing the pudendal yes. and clitoral nerve blocks, and was she, and was she taking any other medication at the time your license was suspended? Yes, she's taking the same medication she takes now. She's taking uh, narcotics. Uh, she's taking um, Exalgo, or you know, it's a long-acting Dilaudid. She's taking Valium. She's taking uh, Flexerol. She, and the only way she can actually live without screaming is to take so much medication th that she has to put herself to sleep. And, so and she, she and spends her, her days sleeping or screaming or sitting on a toilet because she can't uh, uh, have a bow normal bowel movement or normal urination. And this is from the damage from the pudendal nerve that Dr. That Dr. Uh, Jordan did. And I, I these experts, have, uh, he's, it's not a pain disease. That's why his experts are, were useless. Can, and, and just, sorry, I'm just trying to clarify. And, and the prescriptions, the pain meds she's taking, who's prescribing those? Now? Mm -hmm. It's a Dr. Tolbert, and she's prescribing, prescribing exactly the same medicines and the same doses that I was prescribing. Okay. Nothing has changed except she needs now much more flexural because that put, Dr. puts Markman, her to sleep. Thank, thank I you. think you've answered the question. Thank you. Thank Are you. there any other questions from any of the members of the panel? All right. Then with that, we are adjourned, and we'd ask that the audience and the parties uh, please leave the room while we go into closed session. Thank you. We are off the record. Are we ready? Thank you. We are here on agenda item number four. Good morning. We are on the record. Uh, we are here for oral argument following the Superior Court's issuance of a writ of mandate and remand to the Medical Board in the matter of Mary Ming Zhu, MD, OAH, excuse me, Medical Board, case number 12, 2008, 191190. My name is Beth Faber Jacobs. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I've been assigned to sit with the board and preside over today's proceedings. Today is October 24th, 2013, and it is about 10.20 a.m. Uh, counsel, may I have your appearances for the record, starting with the complainant, please. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Josh Tomplay for the complainant. Sir, and is the microphone next to you? I believe so. Can you repeat your name for the record, please? Josh Tomplay, Deputy Attorney General for the complainant. My last name is spelled T-E-M-P-L-E-T. Tomplet? Is that yeah. how it's pronounced? It's, it's, uh, it's, fr it's poor French, Tomplay. Tomplay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Tomplay. And... 
second, please. And counsel for respondent, appearances, please. Uh, Stephen Bassoff, it's B A S S O F F, uh, representing Dr. Zhu, who is present. Thank you. Before we begin, there's a few things I'd like to share about my background and about my role in these proceedings. Um, Mr. Tom Play is with the Attorney General's Office. I would like you to know that for many years I was a Deputy Attorney General in the Attorney General's Office and for many years was in the health quality enforcement section that Mr. Tom Play is in. Although I have never met Mr. Tom Play before, and I also represented the medical board, but did not meet the panel members that are here today until this morning. I have not spoken to any members at the Attorney General's office or the board about this case at all. And I would like to emphasize that I have a very limited role in this proceeding. I am not the decision maker. The board will be making the final decision in this case. There may be some legal issues that arise that I will rule on. I believe I can be fair and impartial and provide a, a fair proceeding to all parties. But I wanted to share this information before we proceeded. Are we ready to proceed? Uh, yes, Your Honor, and, and we have no objection to your hearing the matter. Thank you. And, sir, I'll ask also that you speak up because if I'm having difficulty hearing you, I want to make sure it's also making its way to the record. Thank you. Okay. Um, may I begin? Well, actually, I just want to emphasize that, uh, that you know our time limitations, 15 minutes and 15 and 5 and 5, and I will be keeping time. Would you like a two-minute warning when you've got two left? Uh, yes. All right. And you also know the, the limited issue that is being addressed today? Uh, yes. All right. Then with that, uh, yes, sir, you may proceed. Okay. Um, as Your Honor indicated, uh, the remand notice that we received concerned, I guess, I guess two, two issues. Uh, one particular client, client BC. Um, we believe as you review the record, and I'll try not to go over everything that I've written to you, but as the uh, Superior Court judge found, there is insufficient evidence to support finding 34 and 37 with regard to extreme departure from the standard of care. Um, as the record indicates, there were three experts that testified at this proceeding. Uh, Dr. Benda D and Dr. Franklin represented the board. Dr. Capazzoli uh, testified on behalf of Dr. Zhu. Uh, Dr. Capazzoli in the past had provided expert testimony on behalf of the medical board. With regard to BC, there were uh, two findings of extreme departures from the standard of care. One concerned that uh, Dr. Zhu uh, did not treat or acknowledge a, uh, acute coronary syndrome and myocardial infarction. Um, both of those, there's insufficient evidence to support those findings. The um, record clearly indicates, uh, based upon both Dr. Benda and Dr. Capazzoli's testimony, that both of those were considered and ruled out by Dr. Zhu, and there really was no basis in the record. Uh, it appears that, that Dr. Franklin uh, perhaps misread the note, but the bottom line is that there was not sufficient evidence to support a finding that Dr. Zhu uh, committed an extreme departure of sta from the standard of care by not considering ACS or MI. Now, with regard to finding 37, there's even less evidence with regard to that. It appears from the record that it is solely based on Dr. Franklin's uh, review of a transcript of a, um, I guess, an interview that Dr. Zhu had with a medical board physician. However, when Dr. Zhu testified at hearing, uh, it was very, very clear that, that she knew the impact of nitroglycerin with regard to stable angina uh, and that Dr. Franklin simply, and her testimony is clear, it's cited in the record, I won't go back to the page, but it was cited in my uh, points and authorities in support of the writ and also cited by the, by the court. Now, the issue that I would like to talk about is the second issue that, that the board outlined here with regard to the issue of penalty. Um, we believe that the penalty um, was extreme in five years. Um, Dr. Zhu is a very, very good physician. 
This is her first uh, instance of appearance before the board. She worked in an extremely difficult environment. While we acknowledge that the standard of care uh, is the same, whether you're a physician working in a prison or I guess a physician working uh, in the best hospital uh, in California, the simple fact of the matter is that there were extreme circumstances at California prisons with regard to medical care. I'm not going to go into it, but Dr. Zhu and other physicians were working with a difficult client base with limited resources, so much so that the federal court, as you know, has taken over health care in California prisons. She was working in something that was titled an emergency room, but the simple fact of the matter was it did not have any of the equipment that you would commonly find in an emergency room. It was, as the evidence showed in the record, a glorified, I guess, a, a clinic. And so those were the circumstances under which she was, she was working. In, a, in addition to that, the, um, she had, it's in the record, she had a limitation based upon the, uh, the administrators at the California Medical Facility that there was a time limit within which a physician could keep an inmate in the, um, in the emergency room. And so um, she did not have the luxury based upon uh, uh, direction from her superiors to have them stay in the emergency room for a long period of time. I think the limit was two or three hours. And you have to check, check in the record, but there was a limitation. With regard to the other patients, I, I think there's a, a, a misunderstanding with regard to the patients that she was working with uh, at the time, or the five patients in question. With regard to patient HH, um, first it should be noted that it was only Dr. Franklin who found an extreme departure from the standard of care. Neither Dr. Capazzoli nor Dr. Benda found an extreme departure from the standard of care. But, but the issue seems to be based upon a, a misunderstanding of HH's condition. And if I think if you go back through the medical records, there, there was an assumption made by Dr. Franklin that um, HH uh, had suffered a heart attack uh, back in the 1980s. I think if you go back through the, and he was suffering from a coronary artery disease. And the simple fact is that there was nothing in the record to support that. If you go back and look at Dr. Capazzoli's testimony, you will see that he, he testified that his review of the record showed that HH, and I think I'm pronouncing this right, had an angiogram or something similar to that, which showed no coronary artery disease. So the, the finding that Dr. Franklin made is that this, he based his conclusion on an assumption and there was nothing in the record to indicate that um, this man did in fact have coronary artery disease at the time Dr. Zhu was treating him. Now, in, in addition to that, we, we had two um, experts testify that there was no extreme departure from the standard of care. And I'm not, throughout, throughout the decision, there, is, there are findings made by the board indicating that where there is a, a conflict in evidence, uh, there's a question about, not evidence, it is when there is a conflict among the experts uh, with regard to a finding of whether there was a departure from the standard of care, that it's not entirely clear. And the board found that in those instances, they couldn't find it a departure from the standard of care. In, in, in these instances, with, all, with BC and with HH, there was a conflict among the experts as to whether there was a departure from the standard of care and whether there was an extreme departure from the standard of care. Um, you know, so it was, it was unclear in the record. My point with regard to HH is, is not to challenge that finding because we can't. The Superior Court sustained it. But my point is to show that Dr. Zhu did not just cavalierly treat these patients, okay? She did not just dismiss them. I mean, there, there's an impression, I think, 
at least in the decision, that, that, that she didn't give attention to these individuals. With regard to H.H., she did give attention to him. She examined him. She, um, I think she said she did a, a, I think she did an EKG and a troponin level on him and found that he wasn't suffering from um, uh, either MI or uh, coronary artery disease. Now, now with, re with regard to J.E., and again, I'm looking at this finding not to attack it, but to explain it. She just didn't, there's an impression that she just let this gentleman leave. That is simply not, not the case. Uh, Sir, she, yes? do you understand that the only issue with respect to the merits that oral argument is supposed to address is BC, that and penalty? And you have, at this moment, you have uh, about six and a half minutes okay. left. M m my point in addressing these findings is to show that Dr. Zhu did treat these individuals. With regard to J.E., there was a question about his neurological function. She gave him, she, she gave him a neurological examination and found there was nothing wrong with him. She ordered tests for, for this gentleman. She did not simply let this gentleman go. I, I think with regard to penalty, there's a couple of things. Dr. Zhu, as I said, has, has a uh, long and successful history uh, as a physician. She's also treated hundreds of patients at CDCR w w without, without incident. Um, with regard to, and she does not take the board's uh, penalty lightly, nor does she think that um, she's, she's above this. She has participated in every single um, point of probation. Uh, she has completed every single point of probation with the exception of the length of time. And that's what we're requesting here, a reduction in the length of time. She, she has demonstrated through the years that she's a, a good physician. Um, the patients in question, there were five patients with regard to this proceeding, none of them suffered any harm. There, there was no catastrophic or significant uh, result to these patients. They all did not suffer any significant harm. And so what we're, what we're requesting, I mean, Dr. Zhu acknowledges that there were, there were some mistakes, and she accepts responsibility. But what we're asking for is consideration in the reduction of the penalty because um, we don't believe that what occurred justifies a five-year probationary period. May Dr. Zhu make a quick comment? Well, she can, if she's going to say anything, I would have to put her under oath, but on, because this is on remand, we are restricted to the record from the Superior Court and what occurred at the administrative level, unless someone from the board wants her to do so. But technically, we are restricted to that on remand. Okay, okay. So I would just, uh, could I reserve my time? I you still have four minutes, sir. Okay. Um, In, in going over the, and I just want to make sure that um, when the board reviews the record, it, it's very, very clear that, that she, um, the diagnoses ultimately that she made for all these patients turned out to be correct with regard to, to each of the patients. Even though the experts found some shortcomings her diagnosis at the time of these gentlemen all turned out to be correct. So I, I think I'll leave it at that, Your Honor. Thank you very much. You'll give me just one moment. All right, Mr. Temple, would you like to proceed? Good morning, Your Honor and board members. Good morning. The penalty imposed by the board on respondent is the minimum available under the board's disciplinary guidelines a five-year probation term, and a stayed revocation of her license. Following the 2011 hearing in this case and the 2012 writ proceeding, there remained at least four independent findings of respondents' misconduct. Under the board's guidelines, any one of these findings, considered by itself, requires a minimum penalty of five years of probation. The board's original and minimal pen penalty remains appropriate and is supported by any and each of these four findings. To briefly re recap the history in this case, in December 2011, the board adopted as its decision in order 
the administrative law judge's findings that the respondent had committed the following. Eight acts of simple negligence, including repeated negligence, regarding four of respondent's patients, inadequate record keeping as to all five of the patients at issue, and four instances of gross negligence. Respondent subsequently filed a writ challenging only the latter of these findings, the four instances of gross negligence. The Superior Court sustained two of those findings and remanded the other two for consideration today. The two instances of gross negligence in question have no bearing on the minimal and reasonable penalty the Board has already imposed on respondent. Indeed, the complainant concedes that these two findings should be set aside as unsupported by the factual findings. So setting aside the two, these two factual findings, we are left with ample and alternative grounds supporting the Board's imposition of the minimal penalty under the guidelines. Looking at the guidelines, the recommended penalty for gross negligence or repeated negligent acts or failure to maintain adequate records ranges from a stayed revocation with five years probation to an outright revocation. So here a respondent has been found to have committed both gross negligence and repeated negligent acts and a failure to maintain adequate records. So let's review the four remaining findings uh, regarding respondent. The guidelines provide that a single finding of gross negligence deserves a minimum term of five years of probation. Well, here we have two such findings. That's two grounds for a five-year probation term. The guidelines also provide that inadequate record keeping alone deserves a minimum probation term of five years. Uh, here, respondent has been found to have kept inadequate records. Uh, that's a third ground. And further, the guidelines provide that repeated negligence alone deserves a minimum probation term of five years. And here, eight findings of simple negligence support respondents' repeated negligence, and that's a fourth ground. In sum, four independent grounds support imposing a minimum five-year probation term. Now, given the multiple finding of, findings of respondents' mis misconduct, each of which carries a minimum penalty of five years probation, the board's decision to stay revocation of her license and to impose only the minimal five-year term of probation seems exceedingly fair. No lesser term of probation should be considered, and there should be no downward departure from the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Besoff, would you like to do your rebuttal? Uh, yes, Your Honor. If you'll give um, me one and, moment so okay. I can set the timer. Sorry for the technology here. You may begin. Thank you. I think the point is that these are guidelines. These are not set in concrete. If they, if they were set in concrete, we would need to make a presentation in front of the board. The simple fact of the matter is that these are guidelines, and you are charged with, with making, you know, an appropriate decision given all the facts and given all the circumstances. And that's what we're, that's what we're asking you to do. You, you, you consider, you ask about, you ask about mitigation. If, if, if you didn't ask that question, or if you didn't want to know circumstances of mitigation, and you didn't ask a question about penalty, you know, then, then um, it would seem to me that there's consideration can be given to, to not conform <coughs> to the guidelines. Otherwise, you wouldn't ask those questions. And I think the, these are circumstances. Um, this is not a repeat offender, but it's also somebody who during the, during the um, during hearing acknowledged, readily acknowledged difficulty with the notes. Okay, she readily acknowledged that, and she did not. She did not contest that. Um, again, you have to consider the circumstances, um, and and that it doesn't justify it, but it may in some way explain uh, the difficulty in working at the California Medical Facility and what was going on during during this period of time. So I, I think that that these are guidelines, and again, this isn't somebody who has said, you know, I don't know why they did this, did this to me. Um, 
you know, they're all wrong. She has embraced the conditions of probation. She was, she was, she, she's willing to learn, she's willing to improve. As I said, she's, got, she's completed all the coursework relative to probation. The only thing left now is the five years. And what we're asking is consideration in reduction of that penalty. M move away from the guideline. Uh, otherwise, why would we discuss with you uh, mitigation, uh, harm to the public? There's never been any showing other than the general proposition that when a doctor does something wrong, the, the public can be harmed. There was no specific showing that Dr. Zhu harmed any, any of the patients. Uh, she treated the patients. She believed she was treating them appropriately. That others found that she made errors. Um, you know, that, that, that's the way it is. But if you go through the record, you'll see that, that the experts did not agree on where there were errors. And so, you know, it, it's somewhat difficult at times to hit a moving target, I guess. But the reality of the situation is that you have the authority to move beyond the guidelines, you have the authority to consider something lesser, and that's what we're requesting here today, that you do use your authority and use your discretion and apply a two-year probationary period to Dr. Zhu. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Templet, would you like to uh, have your five minutes rebuttal? Yes, yes, please. You may begin. Thank you. The respondent rejects the penalty imposed by the board, the minimum available under the board's guidelines. Uh, instead, the respondent insists that she is entitled to a downward departure from this minimum penalty. Uh, but respondent cannot escape the fact that any, four, any of the four independent grounds require a minimum of five years probation under the guidelines. If anything, the findings that the respondent violated the f guidelines four times over <laughs> suggests that the maximum penalty, revocation, may be appropriate, or at least a penalty above and beyond the minimum, such as a seven-year or a 10-year term of probation. Uh, inexplicably, respondent instead asks the board to depart from the guidelines altogether to impose a lesser term of probation below the minimum level. I'd also like to remind the board that uh, in this case, as in all cases, a respondent will be eligible to file a petition for early termination of probation uh, if she is, as uh, her counsel says, uh, completing these requirements successfully. And she would be eligible to file that petition two years after the effective decision in this matter, uh, which would be next month. The board's original and minimal penalty remains appropriate and is supported by any and each of the four alternative findings of respondent's misconduct. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions from any of the panel? Yes, Dr. Levine. Uh, just, just to clarify, sir, um, that Dr. Zhu has successfully completed the prescribing practices, medical record course, and the PACE program? Yes, ma'am. And um, it, it, there's a statement in the record about no CME since 2008. Is that accurate? If we're going to have the respondent respond, I do need to swear her in. There's no problem with doing so. Um, I'd be happy to, I'm happy to do so, but my instructions have been that we swear in anyone who is a respondent. So f let's do it so that we can have the answer. Ma'am, if you'll please rise. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you'll be giving today will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please be seated. And if you can answer Dr. Levine's question about your CMEs. Uh, we have, uh, while I was at CMF, the prison, we had weekly CMEs, and I have certificates for that. After leaving CME, I didn't apply for a job uh, because I had these marks on my record. However, what I was doing was preparing for my uh, PACE program at San Diego. Here's a certificate that I have completed 40 CME credits. I've just completed that uh, August of this year, and I'm ready to take the next CME, which I think will be in dermatology. I, I would like to shore up my knowledge. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Yes, doctor. So, Dr. Zhu, since you left uh, the uh, state prison system, uh, have you been working and practicing? 
And how many hours per uh, week or a month? I have a wonderful part-time job, which I love. I am in a um, clinic for the homeless in the Mission District in San Francisco. They're wonderful patients. I started there May 20th of this year. I work 20 hours on the payroll. I work an additional three off payroll, uh, partly to make sure my notes are absolutely clear and verbose, and I cover everything. Uh, we have online uh, records now, and this facilitates things a great deal, as opposed to our ER sheet in the prison, which was 8 by 11, with my space limited to about 3 inches. Um, Thank you. Oh, uh, and, and in between, I've done some locum tenens. I was uh, three times uh, in the previous, in the past three years, working for the Indian Health Service. I was at uh, Fort McCloskey, uh, north, northern Nevada, and uh, at uh, Pyramid Lake Indian Reservation, which is an hour out of Reno. Uh, the rest of my interim time, I was preparing like crazy for PACE, which turns out to be a second set of National Medical Board examiners. It's their exam that I took. So essentially, I earned my MD twice, and D I, I Doctor, took it seriously. I think you've answered the question. Thank you. Are Sorry. there any other questions? All right, then this matter is under submission. We are going to ask that the parties and the audience please leave so that the board can go into executive session. Thank you very much. I was asked if we would be announcing a decision in this proceeding. No, the decision will not be verbally announced. A decision will be issued by the board. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you, everyone. We are off the record. Are we ready to begin in the recording? Are we ready to be on? All right. <coughs> so good morning. good morning. We are on the record. We are here for oral argument following the issuance of a writ by the Superior Court and the remand to the Medical Board of the decision in the accusation against Joel Barnett Singer, MD. It is OAH case number 2012-100212. And medical board case number 16, 2001, 2011, 220456. My name is Beth Faber Jacobs. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. I've been assigned to sit with the board today and to preside over these proceedings. Today is Thursday, October 24th, 2013. And it is about 11.30 p.m., or excuse me, a.m. Council, may I have your appearances starting with complainant? Judge, Deputy. Excuse me, there is a, an issue? Uh, no, no, Judge, I just wanted to uh, recognize another pa panel member being here, Ms. Shipsky. Thank you. We have an, uh, another panel member who's come. Hello, thank you. Thank Welcome. You. All right, Ms. Simon. Deputy Attorney General Jane Zach Simon on behalf of the complainant. Good morning. And for the respondent. Kathleen Morgan on behalf of the respondent, Dr. Singer, who is present. Thank you. Uh, before we proceed, there are a few things that I'd like to disclose about myself and to explain about my role in this proceeding today. As you know, Ms. Simon is with the Attorney General's office. I want you to know that I was with a Deputy Attorney General in the Attorney General's office for many years and for the last several of those years was in the health quality enforcement section with Ms. Simon. We were friendly with each other, although we were in different cities. I have not spoken to Ms. Simon about this case at all. I only met the board members in this proceeding for the first time today, and I 
have a very limited role in this proceeding. I will not be the decision maker. I am not the decision maker. It is the board. There may be some legal issues that arise. If they do, I will rule on those. I believe I can be fair and impartial and give both sides a, a fair process, but I did want to give you this information before we begin. Are, are we ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Thank Your you. Honor. All right. Then you've already been advised that each party has 15 minutes and then five minutes for a rebuttal and the specific issues that are to be addressed in this oral argument. Starting with Ms. Morgan, would you like to begin? Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm not going to reiterate what's in my papers, but what I would like to point out is that public reprimand is the appropriate discipline in this case. And that is based on the Honorable Ernest H. Goldsmith's decision. He was very clear that revocation was unreasonable and grossly excessive. He also found that the Connecticut discipline was a relatively minimal penalty. And it is important to understand that California is essentially piggybacking on the Connecticut's findings and on their discipline. Probation in this case would be akin to revocation. Dr. Singer does not practice in California. He has no plans to practice in California. And he could not comply with any probation terms which would require him to practice in California or, as the complainant has suggested, take PACE training. And so the result <clears throat> would be he would either have to surrender his license for not complying or revocation for not complying. He does not want to do that. He has no other choice at this point but to be licensed. And a public reprimand would ensure the safety of patients of people who reside in California. It would also be in line with the Connecticut penalty. The other finding by Do uh, the Honorable Ernest H. Goldsmith, which must be followed, is that there was no patient harm found or alleged. And that is very important in this case. The guidelines do allow for public reprimand when the circumstances require it. And in this case, what we're talking about were some clinical problems which have been resolved, which did not result in any harm to any patient. I do not feel I need the entire 15 minutes because this is a very straightforward case. Any discipline should be piggybacked onto Connecticut. And what I say by that is whatever the Connecticut Disciplinary Board determines, that should be California's determination. So if they determine that Mr. Uh, Dr. Singer has fulfilled his probationary requirements, then that is what California should find. They are the agency who has overseen his clinic and his physician's license, and they are the ones who investigated. So at the end of this, we believe that the appropriate is public reprimand, but if you must issue probation, then it should be on terms to completely follow Connecticut and to allow any probationary terms to end when the Connecticut board ends the probation in Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Simon? <clears throat> I also will not reiterate everything that is in our brief. Um, 
but just to focus on the fact that we are here today to determine on remand what is the appropriate penalty to be imposed in this case in light of the Superior Court's order on remand. It's important to keep in mind that Joel Singer is a physician who for the past approximate decade has been unable to consistently practice medicine within the applicable standard of practice in his home state of Connecticut. He has been disciplined by the Connecticut Board three times, which has in turn brought him now before this board on his third occasion. The court has stated that revocation of the license, outright revocation, is not an appropriate or available penalty in this case. So the task that confronts this board is to fa fashion a disciplinary order that, first of all, conforms to the remand order, and second, and most importantly, protects the California public while allowing Dr. Singer to retain his California license under terms and conditions short of revocation. The ultimate decision to be made by this board under the remand order should consider and address, um, the court has directed the board to consider and address the declaration submitted by Dr. Singer at the January 2013 hearing, um, including his assertion that he has complied with the Connecticut order and that at some point in time, um, patients were apparently satisfied with the care that they received from Dr. Singer. The Superior Court has also directed the board to consider a new declaration that Dr. Singer filed at the time of the RIP proceeding which asserts that the revocation of his California license under the board's disciplinary order resulted in the loss of his hospital privileges in Connecticut. Even when considering these additional items that the court has directed the board to consider, the current problems raised by this case are not insignificant. The ambulatory surgery facility that is solely owned and operated by Dr. Singer was found by um, Connecticut inspection authorities to be deficient in ways which are very basic and clearly go to the issue of patient safety. There was a lack of appropriate nursing oversight. There was a lack of current CPR certification of the nursing staff. There were deficiencies in sanitation and infection control practices. Now, Dr. Singer's brief that was submitted in this case um, makes the point that there was no allegation or finding of patient harm and goes on to say that the patients were not put at risk. In light of the deficiencies that were found by the Connecticut inspection authorities, it is troubling that Dr. Singer continues to insist that his um, substandard surgical facility did not pose a risk to patients. Now the board has also been directed by the Superior Court to consider the potential consequences to Dr. Singer of a disciplinary order. Even with that consideration, it is the board's paramount duty and paramount consideration to be public safety. It is not what is convenient for Dr. Singer and um, what works for him um, given his desire to stay in Connecticut and his choice not to come to California to work on a probation if one is imposed. Um, Dr. Singer holds a California license and as such, he is subject to whatever orders this board deems necessary in order to protect California consumers. Now keeping in mind the competing objectives um, that we have here of physician rehabilitation and um, public safety, this case is simply not one that can be appropriately and safely resolved by the issuance of a third public reprimand. <coughs> the underlying conduct, as I've mentioned, dealt with Dr. Singer's maintenance of a surgical facility in a manner which, again, departed from the standard of practice. These were not de minimis violations, and indeed, the Connecticut Board required a period of probation and oversight and monitoring by that board. It also can't be ignored that, and this was something that was observed by the administrative law judge in the original decision, 
that past reprimands have not served to ensure that Dr. Singer conforms his practice to governing standards. Under the board's disciplinary guidelines and in consideration of the unique facts of this case, public protection requires a period of assessment, evaluation, oversight, and monitoring. If we just consider the guidelines for unprofessional conduct, <coughs> in a case that is not suitable for a public reprimand, and I explained and explained in our brief, this is not such a case, the minimum guidelines call for a revocation stayed with five years period of probation. An education course would be required a course in professionalism designed to impress upon Dr. Singer that it is simply not acceptable to come before a licensing board every few years with still another example of substandard practice or unprofessional conduct. Dr. Singer should be evaluated um, by PACE or an equivalent program to determine whether he is, um, he is capable of practicing within the standard of practice and he would require a practice monitor. The guidelines also suggest a no solo practice provision. I think it bears mentioning that Dr. Singer's argument and the premise underlying his argument really misses the point about the purpose of disciplinary action by this board. Dr. Singer may not be practicing in California and he may not at this point in time plan to practice in California but he holds a license that authorizes him to treat California patients in this state. Um, to the extent that he has demonstrated that he has engaged in unprofessional conduct or violated provisions of the Medical Practice Act, it is this board's responsibility to address the concerns or deficiencies that are raised by virtue of that conduct. And the failure to do so poses a risk to public safety. The issue is not really whether Dr. Um, Singer actually practices in California or whether he, uh, imposing a period of probation would be inconvenient for him or require him to make choices that he doesn't wish to make. The point is that he has a California license. He has the right and the authority to practice medicine in California and that's what our disciplinary system and our disciplinary guidelines have been carefully designed to address. So with that, I would submit that a um, disciplinary order consistent with the board's disciplinary guidelines is both appropriate and necessary and conforms to the remand order. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> would you like to do, um, Ms. Morgan, would you like a rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor. Five minutes. You may begin. Um, the administrative law judge's decision went before a superior court judge. He found it was unreasonable and grossly excessive. The very same arguments you just heard, he said, were no good. In his decision, he said the relatively minimal penalty imposed by the Connecticut Medical Licensing Board. It is not sufficient to say this statute was broken, so therefore he did all these things. Connecticut is the investigating agency. They were the ones who looked at what actually happened. And they are the ones who are monitoring Dr. Singer. They are the ones who have direct knowledge as to the seriousness or relatively minimal nature of the violations. And Honorable Ernest Goldsmith said they determined a relatively minimal penalty was appropriate. What also cannot be overturned in your decision is the fact that the court found that no patient harm was found or alleged. That is in the court's decision. So there cannot be a finding 
of patient harm because that would not be in conformance with Dr. Uh, Judge Goldsmith's decision. I would also like to talk about the concept of rehabilitation. Connecticut is the board who is investigating and determining rehabilitation. When or if they determine that probation is no longer necessary for Dr. Singer in Connecticut, they have to factor in rehabilitation. So therefore, since they are the ones who are in fact overseeing him and actually overseeing his actual practice, not a mythical practice that may occur in some time in the future, but his actual practice, you should take into account their findings. And they will take into account rehabilitation. And there is no reason to believe that they will allow the people of Connecticut to be at risk. And when they determine that probation is no longer necessary, I'm asking that you make the same finding unless you can find that for whatever reason they are negligent in their duties. And you will not be able to find that. As to the fact of repeated uh, violations, there are no repeated violations. The two prior public reprimands were single isolated incidents and have not been repeated. Neither one repeated the first one and the current allegations are not a repeat of the same violations. Dr. Singer has been able to get his practice in compliance and he did not repeat them. So by saying this is his third time, this is not a three strikes you're out criminal matter. It has no relevance to the current action, which I would also like to point out, Connecticut investigated all three. All three actions were based on incidents that happened in Connecticut, were investigated by the Connecticut Department of Public Health. They've taken into account those instances as well. And there's no reason for California to put more emphasis on something than the actual agency who is investigating these. And that's not to minimize your job. Absolutely, you need to make sure that California people are safe. But you can do that by having a public reprimand uh, against Dr. Singer. He doesn't practice in California. There are no plans to practice in California. If he does, you will know. But it would not serve anything other than to punish him by putting probationary terms on him. And the purpose of this proceeding is not to punish. And that is what it would be if it was anything more than public reprimand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Simon, rebuttal? Very briefly, there is a great deal of territory between the revocation that the Superior Court judge found to be grossly excessive in this case and a public reprimand. And the territory covered therein is where we are in this case. This is not the most minimal case, and it's, according to Judge Goldsmith, not a revocation case, an outright revocation case. It is a case of general and professional conduct <coughs> based on the action of the Connecticut Board. And this board is not um, supposed to be um, someone who simply sits back and lets the Connecticut Board decide what is best in California. Um, under our statutes and under our law, the out-of-state discipline serves as a basis for the independent duty of this board to assess and evaluate a case and determine based on our disciplinary structure and our disciplinary guidelines and the way that this board does its business, what is an appropriate um, consequence for the out-of-state discipline. Judge Goldsmith's order did not say, nor could it properly have said, that the board is bound to enter an order that is identical to the Connecticut order. That isn't what this case is about. And I would submit that the terms and conditions contained in the board's disciplinary guidelines would address the issues raised by this case. 
Thank you. Are there any questions from any of the panel members? Then if there are not, this matter is now submitted. We uh, thank the parties and we ask that the parties and the audience uh, please leave the room as the panel goes to closed session. This matter is now Suffer through it. Really two hours in there. You could probably you could probably do it in an hour, and a half, hour and forty minutes, but that's no uh, good afternoon. Yeah. It's horrible. And um, I um, want to apologize to to those of you who've been waiting for the meeting to begin. We um, our morning ran late, and we are all treated to a very interesting presentation over the lunch hour, um, and so we will we are actually beginning about thirty minutes later than planned. Um, before we actually start, I'd like to ask anyone in the room to please turn off the ringer on your cell phones and for board members, if you've got phones that are on, to move them off the table um, just so that they don't interfere or feedback with the audio system. Um, and many of the board members are using computers and tablets to, use, to access materials we're trying desperately to move from a paper-based world. Um, in fits and starts. Um, this is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California, and we will conduct this meeting as effectively and efficiently as possible. Um, we have a designated time on the agenda for public comment, and we'll ask for public comment on each agenda item, as well as for public, uh, public comments on items not on the agenda. Um, and we'll ask speakers to please adhere to the three-minute time limit for your comments, we will be timing the comments as we do have a, a very packed agenda. Um, and I want, uh, before we start, I do want to say that we are going to, to t we're going to um, adjourn the meeting at 5 p.m. tonight. Um, the panel B will return to its closed session. We're unable to complete our business um, this morning, and so we will return to our closed session at five o'clock and we'll conduct that business from five to six. So we will be aiming at um, <laughs> adjourning the meeting at five. And just for those of you who are following the agenda, item 18, which is the report on the Health Professions Education Fund, will be moved to tomorrow morning to follow the regulatory hearing. Um, and just as a reminder, um, if I, I will be calling um, on speakers based on the slips that I've been given for any member of the audience who wishes to speak on an item uh, that's on the agenda and who hasn't filled out a slip, I will recognize you, just raise your hand, and we'll ask that you fill out a slip after you fit completed your comments. Um, and again, would ask all speakers to keep their comments to three minutes or less. Um, and before, again, before we adjourn the meet, uh, before we commence the meeting, um, and uh, take role, I just want to take a moment um, to reflect in the minutes and to share with members of the public how much the members of the board um, will miss our friend, colleague, and former board member, Dr. Janet Salmonson. Um, Janet passed away on September 10th of this year after a very brief illness and after returning from a medical mission that she was conducting um, in, in um, South America. Janet was an incredibly talented surgeon and a very va valuable member of this board. Um, she did a lot of charity work for children in Central America and South America, and actually across the world. Um, and her, in her specialty, which is plastic and reconstructive surgery, and where her, her charitable work was, was dedicated to children with cleft palates and other facial deformities that were remediable with plastic surgery. She served as, uh, as a member of this medical board from 2006 through July of 2013 and made enormous contributions to the board. For those who would like to make a donation in memory of Dr. Salmonson, either Faces of Hope or Rotoplast, two volunteer missionary organizations with whom she worked, um, have been designated as the recipients of donations in her memory. Um, Thank you very much, and Ms. Toof, could you please, I'll call the meeting to order and ask you to take the um, roll. Absolutely.
Dr. Levine? Here. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Here. Dr. Diego? Dr. Bishop? Here. Dr. Gananadev? Here. Dr. Kraus? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Ms. Pines? Ms. Shipsky? Here. Mr. Tagami? Ms. Wright? Here. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Present. And Dr. Yip? Here. Thank you. So I'm going to um, move to the um, agenda item three, approval of minutes um, from the July 18th, 19th meeting. Board members have the minutes in their packet. Are there any? Um, I'll move to adopt. Second. Any comments, any questions? Any comments from members of the public on the July board minutes? Um, it's now my pleasure. Um, oh, oh, sorry. All in favor of accepting the minutes? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Thanks. Um, so I'm going to move to um, agenda. Uh, sorry, any. I already asked about members. Sorry. Um, moving to agenda item four introduction and swearing in of new board members. It's a tremendous pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce to all of us three new members of the Medical Board of California. And I'm going to read brief, their brief bios for you, understanding that their bios will be on the Medical Board website. And we are delighted to have the skills and experience that each of these individuals brings to the Medical Board. Dr. Howard Kreis, Kraus, um, Director of Neurosurgical Ophthalmology at St. John's Brain Tumor Center, since 2007, Director of Ophthalmology for Pacific Eye and Ear Institute since 2002, and an ophthalmologist in private practice and the clinical professor of ophthalmology and neurosurgery at UCLA, um, David Geffen School of Medicine since 1984. Dr. Krauss was an assistant professor at the University of Texas and a systems engineer at Hughes Aircraft Company. Um, Dr. Krauss is an American Board of Ophthalmology diplomat and founding member of the North American Skull Base Surgery Society. He earned a Doctor of Medicine degree from New York Medical College and a Master of Science degree in Aeronautics and Astronautics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I think you're our first astronautics member of the medical board in our history, so groundbreaking. Um, Dr. Ron Lewis. Ronald Lewis has been a physician and surgeon at Ironwood State Prison since 2008, an assistant pr clinical professor at the University of California, San Diego, Department of Medicine since 2000. He has served as an urgent care physician at Eisenhower Immediate Care, Kaiser Permanente Urgent Adult Care Center in San Diego, and at Sharp Reese Steely Medical Centers. Dr. Lewis was director of medical affairs at Agaron Pharmaceuticals, and at Sequest Pharmaceuticals, was a clinical assistant professor at Stanford University School of Medicine, and held multiple positions at Syntex Laboratories, including Associate Director of Medical Services, Senior Associate Director of Medical Services, and Senior Associate Director of Clinical Investigation. He was an emergency department physician at St. Mary's Hospital and Medical Center, and is an American College of Physicians Fellow Dr. Lewis earned his Doctor of Medicine degree from George Washington University, and we welcome you also. Thank you. Jamie Wright, who is sitting to Dr. Lewis's right, has been an attorney in private practice since 2009. She was a contract specialist at the Los Angeles Mayor's Office of Homeland Security in 2010, and a legislative project consultant for the California State Assembly Speaker's Office of Member Services. Ms. Wright was an associate at Sedgwick, Detert, Moran, and Arnold, and a legal extern for the Financial University, F Financial Industry, sorry, Regulatory Authority. She earned her law degree from University of California, Hastings College of Law. And I'd like to ask Dr. Krause, Dr. Lewis, and Ms. Wright to please stand um, and repeat the um, oath, of, oath of office. Yeah, come together. <laughs> yeah. Behind. Uh, 
you go. Yes, here. You stand here. My heart got tall. So they can hear me. And I'm going to ask you to repeat the oath, but say your own names. I. 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 Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear tr true faith and allegiance to the Constitution. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. Of the United, United States, States and the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That, that I, I take, take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without, without any mental reservations or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. Yeah. That I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Please join me in welcoming our three new board members. Um, just to let members of the public know um, that we do this in public um, as a recognition of um, welcoming members to the board. They actually have been sworn, dutifully sworn, prior to their um, arriving at the board today. And um, Dr. Kraus participated in our panel hearing this morning, and Jamie, I think, and Ron also um, in their panel hearings um, this morning also. So. Just to just to let you know, we're we're careful to cross our eyes, and, no, dot our eyes and cross our t's. Um, great, and um, we'll now move to agenda item five. Uh, public comment on items not on the agenda. Um, we will have a timer going, and respectfully, as I said, ask that you complete your comments when time is up. I actually have three comment slips. Um, I will call them in the order in which they were submitted, and if there's anyone else who wishes to add comments. Just let Ms. Toof know. Um, first, um, Jim Peterson and Dolores Green. Could you come to the mic and introduce yourselves to the group? To the speaker's table. And what's that table? Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Jim Peterson. I'm the executive director with the San Bernardino County Medical Society. And to my right here is Dolores Green, who is the executive director of the Riverside County Medical Association. And uh, on behalf of both of our medical societies, we want to welcome certainly the board members, uh, the medical board staff, and our guests here today uh, to the Empire, which we are very proud and very proud of this wonderful facility where you are having your meeting today. Good afternoon. Um, you may not know, but the Inland Empire has about 4,000 practicing physicians, and the two medical associations represent a little over 50% of those doctors. But the Inland Empire is also very impacted uh, by a shortage of physicians. And so we're, we were very happy when 1288 passed, and the medical board will be uh, working and giving priority to physicians who are applying in the medically underserved areas, because obviously that impacts the Inland Empire uh, greatly. So we appreciate that and we hope that we can work with you if necessary on some of those things. Some of the other things in the Inland Empire we're doing that I that um, in collaboration with the medical board is we've held uh, cures registration and we're d also doing um, education to the physicians on o opiate uh, risk management. And so we had an excellent cures program just the other day. And and we also have a very successful health information exchange with about 9 million patient records in the health information exchange right now. And what we're hoping to do is actually do a single sign-on through the HIE for the CURES program. So those are some of the things that, that we hope to work with through the medical board and also the CURES program. So welcome to the Inland Empire. We're happy you're here. Thank you very much. And you have a beautiful city. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, Suzanne Chinese. 
This is... Speaker table okay? okay? Can you please sit at this <coughs> speaker table? Oh, okay. It has the <coughs> timer. The timer on there. So you can see the timer. Oh. Who's running that? Hello. Um, I'm Susan Chinese. I'm here with the Consumer, Consumers Union, California's Safe Patient Network. We um, would like to ask to work with you on the new web portal, Breeze Easy, if that's how you even say it. <laughs> We've reviewed it and found that we, we're not so sure that it's uh, very user friendly for consumers. Um, specifically, it leaves the medical board site to go to the new site, breaking up the information and instructions for consumers, which is already confusing to begin with, and then to break it up. I think we lose something there. Um, also, being a shared site with the physicians, it appears to consumers, I think, that are not used to using sites like this, that you need to register to look up your physician. I think that would deter some consumers. And also, it asks for um, credit cards. They might even feel that they have to pay for this information. So it's just not quite clear. Um, when you go to the complaint process, there's questions regarding the business name, child custody, and gets very confusing who that's really for or why it's even there. So what we're just asking is that you allow us to work with you maybe in making improvements. And what we think we could do for you is um, test this on some consumers and get their feedback so that we could make it you know, nice and easy for everybody. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, before we proceed to our next agenda item, um, I want to introduce to the group several guests that we have with us today who will part who are I'm sorry. Oh. So uh, there may be more public comment. Uh, sorry. I haven't uh, is there anyone else who'd like to make a comment? Oh. Sorry. Um, Dr. Khadija Long. This table, ma'am. This table. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for an opportunity to uh, address this board. My name is Dr. Khadija Lang, and I'm the president of the Charles R. Drew Medical Society. We are the Los Angeles affiliate of the National Medical Association, which represents the interest of some 50,000 physicians of African descent. Um, in the Los Angeles area, we represent some 1,500 physicians. Uh, I'd like to thank the board for the work that they're doing, and I'd like to bring a concern that our members have to the board in hopes that possibly you might help us get some resolution on the matter. Uh, physicians, I ask that you please not bring up any case that is active before the members. Yes, ma'am. Speaking in generalities would be fine. Yes, thank you. Um, our concern is that we're noticing a disparate number of African-American physicians in the Los Angeles area being um, accused and having negative decisions made against their licenses. And we are concerned that the investigators are possibly targeting physicians of lower profit margins because they have not the adequate resources to be able to give a, mount an appropriate defense when accusations are made. And so our concern is that possibly in the interest of being able to demonstrate what a great job they're doing, investigators might be targeting physicians that are representing underserved populations for more aggressive uh, pursuits in their licenses. This result is very discouraging for us, especially at a time when we're looking at the Affordable Care Act being rolled out in January. Many of our communities that we serve have physician ratios of approximately one physician for up to 4,000 patients as compared to other areas of our city that have a ratio of one to about 1,500, uh, one physician per 1,500 patients. So when a physician in these communities served is removed from the pool by having their license revoked or suspended, this has a larger impact on the community served 
because of the fact that they were already so significantly underrepresented. Our society would like to respectfully request that the board let us know how we might go about getting numbers on how many physicians of African American descent have been accused and had negative decisions made against their licenses over the previous five to even 10 years if possible, uh, or if you could recommend to us how we might go about getting that information. If it is not possible to get that information on a racial breakdown, we would greatly appreciate being able to receive this information on the geographical locations of the Los Angeles area. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Are there any members of the audience in addition who would also like to make comments on items not on the agenda? Seeing none, um, we'll move to, um, I, and before we move to agenda item six, I just want to make the audience aware and welcome a um, number of guests in the audience. Mr. Awad Kadani, who is the Chief Deputy Director of the um, Department of Consumer Affairs. Christine Lolly, who is the Deputy Director of Board Relations and our link to the rest of the um, world of the DCA. Mike Gomez, Michael Gomez, who is the Deputy Director of the Division of Investigation in the Department of Consumer Affairs. And Taryn Smith from the from the Senate Office of Research. Welcome to all of you and thank you for coming. Um, and we'll move on now to a presentation that many of us have been waiting for for quite a while. Um, this is a presentation on the interim suspension order process. And I want to welcome Judge Alvord, um, who, the who is the division presiding administrative law judge um, in Los Angeles. I'm in San Diego. San Diego. Um, he graduated from Syracuse University and received his law degree from the University of San Diego School of Law. Judge Albert is the former director of the University of San Diego Administrative Hearing Program and was an adjunct professor of law at the University of San Diego and California Western School of Law. He's been an administrative law judge since 1998 and was previously an administrative hearing officer for the city of San Diego, city of Chula Vista, and San Diego County Employees Retirement Association. Again, I want to thank you for joining us today and to, to helping us up our game in terms of understanding interim suspension orders. My pleasure. Thank you for having me today. Um, I. Uh, would ask for your indulgence to give me a couple of minutes to talk about some of the things that are going on at OAH before I get to the subject of uh, interim suspension orders. Uh, the Office of Administrative Hearings was formed as a central panel administrative law agency, uh, and its mission is to provide administrative hearing services for any state or local government agency that requires them. When I uh, became a presiding administrative law judge at OAH, uh, we, in 2006, we said that we did the hearings for about 800 state and local government agencies. That number is now doubled to 1,600. Uh, we have a director and chief administrative law judge, uh, Linda Kabatik. We have a deputy director, Melissa Crowell. And then we have two divisions. We have a special education division, which does hearings for school districts and families involving special education disputes, disputes about special education services. And we have a general jurisdiction division that does everything else. Uh, my role is uh, presiding administrative law judge over the general jurisdiction division. So I supervise the operations of uh, our four uh, general jurisdiction division offices in Sacramento, Oakland, Los Angeles, and San Diego. I'm physically based in San Diego. Uh, when I became a PJ in 2006, we were actively engaged in a process to try to reduce the amount of time that cases were taking uh, before the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, we were working very hard to reduce uh, the case life, and we were generally able to set new hearings within 120 to 180 days. Uh, in the 2008-2009 time range, uh, during the state budget crisis, the furloughs, hiring freezes, and uh, other resource cuts um, 
had a big effect on OAH, um, and at the same time, our work continued to increase. Um, I'm sorry to say that all that hard work that we were doing in 2006 and 7 um, was turned upside down. Uh, and right now, if you file an ordinary case with OAH, uh, a case that doesn't require statutory uh, priority for hearing, uh, we're getting cases on the calendar. If, it's, if the hearing is going to be three days or more, or more than three days, uh, we're setting those cases about seven months out in Los Angeles, about 11 months out in San Diego. Uh, we're again working hard to try to reduce those timelines. Um, we're currently recruiting for new administrative law judges in San Diego and in Los Angeles. Uh, one of the big factors involved in how quickly we can get cases on the calendar is how many judges we have to hear them. And uh, with the staffing cuts and the inability to hire new judges, our, our staffing levels uh, have gotten below what they were a few years ago. Uh, with these new hires, we'll be back to the staffing levels that we had in 2007. Uh, it's not enough for us to uh, continue to serve the, the, no, uh, the increased number of hearings that we have. We have uh, a budget change proposal pending right now to request authority uh, to hire more administrative law judges and more staff. And I'm going to make a shameless uh, political pitch for support uh, for that budget change proposal. Uh, you can help us help you get your cases on the calendar more quickly uh, if we're able to get more judges. Uh, the other side of the coin is the Attorney General's office. Uh, some of our scheduling issues uh, involve the inability of the Deputy Attorneys General to be available for hearing. They've had staffing cuts and have been unable to fill vacancies as well. Uh, they're in the same boat that we are. and. Uh, so I, I lend my support to their efforts to add more attorneys to their ranks as well. We're also seeing a trend of centralization and consolidation in government. Uh, it's been a big um, emphasis of Governor Brown. Um, OAH, we've seen our areas of jurisdiction expand and uh, new areas of, of hearings open up for us. And we're, uh, it seems like every, every year we're getting new uh, agencies that are bringing their cases to us. Um, we expect that trend to continue. We currently have about eight to 12,000 cases filed a year with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, of those uh, cases, about 1,800 are for the allied health agencies of the Department of Consumer Affairs. About 300 to 400 cases a year for the medical board. We've seen a, a settlement rate on our cases of about 50% in medical board. About, uh, about half of the cases that are filed with us tend to go off calendar. But those uh, numbers are a little bit old, and uh, we have uh, seen a tightening uh, among several of the health care agencies, including the medical board and the nursing board. We've seen uh, a tightening of settlement authority, uh, which has resulted in more cases going to hearing. We have a few new initiatives going on at OAH. Our, our uh, director, Linda Kabatik, uh, has made an, uh, has emphasized um, streamlining, uh, calendaring, uh, our calendaring process, and some other processes. We're instituting an electronic filing project uh, so that attorneys will be able to file with us electronically. Um, we've developed procedures to uh, protect the confidentiality of documents that are submitted to us. Um, we're requiring the parties now to redact uh, any personal confidential information that is submitted to us in a document uh, and to, if, if the document can't be redacted, to seek appropriate, excuse me, I really did turn my phone off, um, to seek appropriate orders sealing the record uh, so that we are better able to protect the privacy of individuals whose records uh, are submitted to us as part of a hearing. We have seen a, a statewide increase in ISO filings, uh, and, and we expect uh, more ISO cases to be submitted. Um, the medical board ISO interim suspension order cases represent about one-third 
of the, all of the interim suspension cases that we hear at OAH. Um, the way these cases come to us is typically we get a phone call from a deputy attorney general who has an ISO that they are ready to file. These cases have to be given calendar priority, so they're, they're pushed on the calendar as quickly as we can get them. Uh, the attorney calls, they either speak with a presiding judge or a calendar clerk, and they say, I have an ISO that we want to file, and we say, when do you want the hearing? And then we try to give them the hearing on the date that they request. Um, we give the, those cases calendar priority, uh, and then they, um, they uh, serve the documents and file the cases with us. ISOs are the only cases that we allow to be actually placed on our calendar before we have the papers. For every other type of case that we have, we require the parties to actually have their papers in hand when they're ready to file with us. Um, ISOs are the example that, they're the, the exception that we make. Um, those cases have three opportunities for hearing. There's an ex parte hearing, which can be done with 24 hours notice. There is a noticed hearing that uh, can happen with um, 15 days notice. And then there is the hearing on the accusation. And all of those hearings uh, will end up getting a calendar priority unless uh, that those timelines are waived. Uh, Judge Alvar, just a, a yes. clarifying question. Mm -hmm. Do all, do, does each request for an ISO involve all three hearings? Some, some of the ISOs might involve only two hearings. Uh, the agency has the option to bring, to seek an ex parte ISO if they're concerned about the public safety interests and they want to get that hearing on the calendar and potentially get orders either suspending or, or limiting uh, practice within a 24-hour time frame. Um, that's a decision that they make. Uh, they do uh, bring some ISO hearings based just on notice. They don't get the ex parte ISO first. They just do the noticed hearing. There are really two code sections that deal with interim suspension cases before OAH. Business and Professions Code Section 494 and Government Code Section 11529. Our judges can suspend a license or impose licensing restrictions uh, when the licensee has engaged in under, this is under section 494 of the Business and Professions Code, when uh, the licensee has engaged in acts or omissions violating the code, uh, convicted of a substantially related crime, uh, and, uh, excuse me, and if uh, permitting the licensee to continue to engage in their licensed practice would endanger public safety or welfare, public health safety or welfare. Those conditions have to be met. Uh, those cases require 15, 15 days notice. There is an option to bring the case ex parte only if serious injury would result to the public before the matter could be heard on notice. If an ex parte ISO is issued, a noticed hearing must take place within 15 to 20 days. So we'll, we'll uh, issue interim orders in the ex parte hearing and then uh, review that matter again 15 to 20 days later in a, in a noticed ISO. If the uh, hearing on the noticed ISO does not happen within those 20 days, the ISO, the, the suspension orders or the interim orders would, would dissolve automatically by operation of law. Uh, the licensee does have the option to waive time, so those hearings can sometimes happen later if there's a waiver. At the ISO hearing, the licensee can be represented by an attorney, has a record made of the proceedings, presents affidavits or other documentary evidence, can present oral argument, the Business and Professions Code Section 494 does not have a specific authorization to receive testimony at the ISO hearing. Our judge is required to make a decision and issue an order within five business days following the close of the evidence. 
our judges often issue orders the same day or, or within just a few days of, uh, of the close of the evidence. The judges may um, suspend the license or impose license restrictions, including uh, biological fluid, fluid testing, supervision, uh, remedial training, or other types of uh, practice limitations, uh, depending on the evidence and the issues. The standard of proof in these cases is preponderance of the evidence. Uh, it's different from a, uh, an accusation case, which requires a clear and convincing evidence standard. These are also decisions which OAH issues as final decisions. These are not proposed decisions that are submitted to the board uh, for adoption. Um, under Business and Professions Code Section 494, the ALJ's decision is final and subject to writ immediately uh, in the Superior Court. The ALJs also have the flexibility to modify uh, the ISOs, expand the ISOs at any time. So often what happens is we issue initial orders and then the parties come back before us during some time frame to seek modification of the orders depending on the circumstances. The, uh, after uh, interim orders are issued, the agency is required to file an accusation within a very short time, 15 days. Uh, and the hearing has to be held within 30 days after receipt of the notice of defense. So when the Attorney General is filing these ISO cases, they have to be ready to go to trial quickly. They have to have their evidence ready, they have to have their witnesses ready, because if the respondent is going to invoke these quick hearing rights, they've got to be ready to go. If the, uh, if the agency doesn't comply with these timelines, and there has not been a waiver of time, then it can result in a dissolution of the ISO by operation of law. Under Business and Professions Code Section 494, if a licensee doesn't comply with uh, the ISO, uh, doesn't comply with its terms, then that could become a separate cause for discipline uh, that the agency might bring against them. The other code section that relates specifically to the Medical Practices Act is Government Code Section 11529. The procedures and, and requirements of 11529 are slightly different than uh, Government Code or Business and Professions Code Section 494. An ALJ can suspend uh, license or impose restrictions when the licensee has or is about to engage in acts or omissions violating the Medical Practices Act. Uh, or is unable to practice safely due to a mental or physical condition. So when there's a mental or physical condition at issue, those cases are brought under uh, Government Code Section 11529. And the, the petitioner, the, the executive officer, is required to prove that permitting the licensee to engage in the profession uh, will endanger the public safety, health, or welfare. These cases also require 15 days notice. There is also a provision for ex parte. If serious injury would result to the public before the matter can be heard on the 15 days notice, uh, we can and do hear these cases within a 24 hour notice period. If we issue an ex parte uh, suspension order or interim orders, uh, the notice hearing has to be scheduled within 15 to 20 days. Uh, and the licensee has to be notified, uh, and the failure for that hearing, of that hearing to go forward within those timelines, unless waived, uh, also results in a, in a dissolution of the interim orders by operation of law. The licensee's rights at these hearings include the right to be represented by counsel, the right to have a record made of the proceeding, uh, the right to present affidavits and declarations and documents, the right to present oral argument, and uh, Government Code Section 11529 specifically allows the ALJ discretion to permit testimony at the ISO hearing. <coughs> the ALJ will grant the ISO or grant some interim orders if there's a reasonable probability 
that a petitioner will prevail in the underlying action, that the likelihood of injury to the public in not issuing the order outweighs the likelihood of injury to the licensee in issuing the order. It's a balancing test. And the standard and burden of proof uh, is the same as a preliminary injunction under the civil code. If an ISO is issued, the board must file an accusation within 15 days. Uh, that's the current law. Uh, there's, a, there's a bill that was passed that I, is uh, effective, I think, January 1st, that is expanding that timeline a little bit um, by another 15 days. Um, but it's still uh, incumbent on the Attorney General's office to be ready to go to hearing in a very short time uh, if they do, uh, if they are successful in getting interim orders issued. The board must issue its decision within 15 days after the decision is received from the ALJ uh, on the accusation. Uh, so there's, a, there's going to be a, a short timeline on the board uh, in reviewing these decisions or the ISO uh, can be uh, dissolved. The ALJ uh, must issue a written decision within 15 days of the hearing on the ISO and the decision must include findings of fact and a conclusion articulating the connection between the evidence and the decision. ISOs are final orders. They are subject to review by writ under Code of Civil Procedure Section 1094.5. Um, we see, uh, at OAH, we see ISO cases, as, as I said, we, about a third of our cases are the medical board, and uh, there are many other agencies that file interim uh, suspension cases with us. Department of Social Services does it, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, the Bureau of Automotive Repair is very active in uh, interim suspension uh, of uh, smog check stations and, uh, and auto repair places. Um, the other allied health boards uh, also bring ISOs uh, when they find, uh, feel it's necessary. The things that we always look out for during our ISO hearings, um, press coverage. These cases can be very high profile uh, and uh, we, we seem to get a lot of media interest in these cases. Uh, our judges uh, pay attention to the notice issues, whether the notice has been served properly, uh, whether enough time has been given, uh, and um, our judges m have to make decisions very quickly about whether to allow witnesses to testify or not since it is, it's a discretionary matter. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Ms. Yaroslavsky. I just have a point of clarification just so I yes. understand between uh, BMP Section 494 and Government Code Section 11529. BMP 429 is the Attorney General's Office has brought you the request for an ISO, and 11529 is our Executive Officer brings the request for an ISO? The Attorney General's Office represents the Executive Officer in both cases. So what's the, the difference the, between the, the two? The procedures are slightly different. The um, Business and Professions Code Section 494 applies to all licensed professionals. So um, the Bureau of Automotive Repair can bring an action against a smog check station under uh, Business and Professions Code Section 494. Uh, Government Code Section 11529 is specifically uh, carved out for uh, violations of the Medical Practices Act. So it's, it's the one that is, it may be used with uh, with uh, medical, with physicians. So would we not use the 494? We would be more inclined to use the, what would be the cause for us to use one or the other? That's a decision the Attorney General makes. Uh, we don't make that decision. They, we, we often see the petitions filed with us invoking both sections. So one is uh, not preemptory, meaning that someone might correct. do something versus someone has already done something. Correct, they, can, they, they have the option of bringing un, under either. Uh, Dr. Lewis. Yes, Judge. Uh, there was a very informative report, especially for some of the, like, myself, like a new board member. I have a question. You made a, um, a statement about on the ALJ's uh, report that 50% of the cases are usually settled. 
and that was due to increase, increasing settlement authority. What did you mean by increasing settlement authority? Increasingly narrow. What? Tightening or increasing? I, yeah, I said tightening, and what I, what I meant was um, we took a look at the numbers uh, of cases that are filed versus cases that uh, end up with a decision, and the difference is about 50%. About 50% of our cases that are filed with us actually go all the way through hearing to decision. Uh, I, what I was mentioning an observation that we've seen in more recent, uh, in about the more rec most recent uh, six to nine months, maybe a year, uh, we have seen uh, that the the healthcare boards, including the medical board and the and the nursing board, have uh, been less willing to authorize settlements than they had been in the past. The they they have been. Our observation has been that they've been less willing to uh, settle cases below the published guidelines. Um, what that means is that when the parties are negotiating a settlement, there are fewer options for the physician in negotiating. Uh, we're, therefore, we're seeing more cases go to hearing. But, but um, we're governed by the Business and Professions Code, so we have sort of some room in between that. So you're saying in the past there was more wiggle room in your observation? Or? In, in the past we saw more, um, I guess wiggle room is a good word. Yeah. Um, in the, in, uh, more, more room for negotiation uh, over the settlement terms. So, so can I, ref is what you're saying you're seeing less willingness to deviate from the disciplinary guidelines in the last six to nine months? Thank you for putting those better words yes. in my mouth. That's exactly That's what, what I was trying, trying to get. Yeah, you're yeah. seeing we're, we're, we're looking at the guidelines more stringently and not deviating from those. That's been the observation and what's been reported to us in, in, in discussion. Yeah, that's an important point, I think, to, to make for everybody. It, it, for me, it it affects how quickly we can get these cases to hearing because if, if less cases are going to settle, more cases are going to go to hearing, it, it, it's, a, it's a resource issue. We're good. Okay, thank you. And a public safety issue. Yes. Um, Ms. Yaroslavsky. So um, I also had heard very clearly what you had to say earlier about uh, you are expecting it new judges and with new judges there will be reduced timelines hopefully and the same thing in the Attorney General's office. But I didn't hear from you um, when you thought that within the next six months you're going to have a full staff, within the next five years you're going to have a next staff. Is there any kind of a timeline that you're looking at that we can look to? Um we are currently recruiting to fill all of the vacancies that we are currently authorized to fill. In the next three to four months, we will be fully staffed with the positions that we're currently allowed to have. We have submitted a budget change proposal which will allow us to add more Open judge above, positions. Okay. I, I have no estimate on the timeline for that budget change proposal. It goes through a number of steps oh, really? and, and uh, levels of approval beyond us. Um, um, we would like it to be approved as soon as possible, but it's beyond our I can understand area. that. Judge, can I just yes. two quick, one quick question. Yes. Um, y you use as a non-lawyer. Um, you used several descriptions of evidence. Um, one was preponderance of evidence. Mm -hmm. And if I could just ask you to sort of summarize where each different standard applies, preponderance of evidence, clear and convincing evidence. And then you said something about evidence consistent with preliminary injunction, which I assume falls somewhere between the two. Preponderance of the evidence is uh, that the evidence is uh, it, it more likely than not. In, and in be, which situation true. does that apply? That applies in, in, the, in the original ISO uh, in, under business professions, co business professions Code Section 494. Okay. And then clear and convincing evidence? Clear and convincing evidence is the standard for a healthcare physician, for a physician in, a, in an accusation case uh, when the issue is whether to revoke the license or, or uh, suspend the license or place the physician on probation. Uh, the evidentiary standard that the it's petitioner high. must meet is clear and convincing. It's a higher standard. It's uh, it's very close to 
the, uh, the reasonable doubt standard that you would see in a, in, a, in a criminal case. And you said in preliminary injunction, which standard applies in that? Um, I would have to look that up. I'm not. Okay, you said something was. Yes, the the, the, the language of the language of. Um, let me find my slide. The language the language of um, of uh, government code section eleven five two nine says that the standard and burden of proof is the same as a preliminary injunction under civil procedure code section five two seven. Okay, great, and. Um, We've been at, we are asked as a board mm -hmm. why, um, what, are the, what are the reasons why when an ISO is sought, it's not granted? And just from your own experience, um, what advice or, or what reflection would you have for us on the top five reasons why a judge is unable to grant an ISO? Well, um, there are several things on the table when an ISO is brought. The, the, sort of the ultimate outcome would be a, a, a complete suspension of the of the license. Um, many cases don't result in an outright suspension but do result in practice restrictions. Um, the judge's job is to weigh the evidence and determine what public protection requires in the short term until the case can be heard on the accusation. And the evidence is limited in those cases. It's based on declarations. It's based on documents and oral argument. And the judge is doing, the administrative law judge is doing a balancing of the public safety need versus the physician's right to have Process. their license. Harm and to so, the physician, right. And so the, 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 the challenge is to guarantee public protection without going overboard. So, so overreach in terms of the request, is that, I mean, so. Well, the request, we don't make the request, we receive the request. No, no, I mean, the, the, right, so what you're saying is if, if suspension, outright suspension is sought, the, the failure to grant that is often replaced with partial or restriction on practice. Because many many the, cases result in some interim orders being issued. Because it, even if it's the, not an outright the evidence suspension. didn't support the what was being sought. Right. Okay. For example, if a, if a physician has a, a, a drug or alcohol problem, um, the evidence may suggest that they don't need to have their license completely suspended if they're currently in a recovery program, if they're showing evidence of, of uh, rehabilitation, they've already taken a lot of steps in recovery. It may be that public protection is satisfied if we put them on a regimen of testing uh, fluid testing and allow them to keep their license. It, it depends on the circumstances, but that is, uh, that's one example. I, you know, on that point, Sharon, I guess, I guess it's suppose on, on what she asked you for the general ob observations as to why an ISO petition is granted or denied or, you know, I suppose if you're on the other end of it, you might come up with your own five different or six reasons. The other end I'm referring to is like this board and the Attorney General's office. I assume there's like a a very detailed due diligence that happens on the petitioner's side. That is, what are the facts of the case? Something egregious has happened. Um, we have a variety of enforcement tools. This is only one, and it's reserved for those special instances where the facts warrant seeking an ISO. So I'm sure Ms. Castro, uh, uh, our staff, we do a heavy duty analysis. We prepare the petition. We look at which one might be the best one to pursue and then we pursue it, right? The judge has its own independent duty to weigh the facts and you're going too far, you're going too less, but you know, the in, there are instances, are, I, I'd be interested in what, sort of what are the percentages, you know, we seek so many petition ISOs and you know, 10% are denied, 50% are, de you know, I, I just sort of wonder, it's like, so it's, to me it would be, well, if a lot are sought and many are denied, then maybe there is a disconnect. Or if a, many are sought and only few are denied, then okay, I, I'm trying to get a handle on Because as our president said, you know, we do hear a lot from the public, seek more ISOs, or why are your ISOs being denied? And that was part of the purpose of today's discussion. You know, I'd be interested in the Attorney General's opinion, maybe not at this hearing, but a, a future one. 
on this topic. Right, so um, I think w we have and have reported to the board a combined number of ALJ and AG turning down the request to proceed for an uh, ISO. We haven't, I don't remember seeing numbers we've broken out, but we can get them. Do you think they might be helped? Well, I think that, sure. Sure. Can I, uh, to, f to further clarify, because where you're going is what I'm curious about is all, all, as well. The question I would also ask is that within the ISO process, either it's approved or it's denied, but isn't there also the, there is the part that if they are doing some behavior that is inappropriate that they may be, you can do a stop practice, for example, on prescribing while you continue to get more information. So I, I think that there's that third right. portion that right. we also maybe need, um, maybe not a handle on, but by the same token, maybe a, um, understanding that it's not just you get an ISO or you don't get an ISO, but depending on the circumstances, if I'm not mistaken, a partial stop practice, which Mistakes. might give the AG's office or the ALJ's office a little bit more time, or I could be wrong on the time part, but there's that third part of the wheel, the third. You're, you're, you're correct that um, it's, not, it's not a win or lose situation and, and it's it's um, it, it's not helpful to look at it that way um, the because there there is that middle ground right. of interim orders being issued practice restrictions fluid testing education um, we I, we've done orders where a, a physician is uh, um, allowed to practice medicine but can't do surgery um, the, it you know they're very fact specific and these would come out of an ISO hearing? It would come out of an ISO hearing, correct. Dr. Bishop. I, I wanted to, to take us back just a bit to the statement you'd made um, about the uh, in re increasing reluctance on the part of um, the medical board and such to have uh, deviation in whatsoever and, and have early settlements when you're uh, doing these cases. And at first blush, that would suggest we're doing a better job. But I just wanted to ask if it's, if it's safe to say that in some instances, um, uh, where, for example, the evidence might be weak, there is a significant doubt that we would get a substantial discipline against the physician, that if we could have an earlier settlement at perhaps a slightly lowered uh, uh, disciplinary status, we're actually getting an earlier oversight of that physician's practice, and perhaps you said it's, it's not an all or none situation, uh, that we are getting that doctor discipline perhaps sooner and substantially, although maybe not perhaps at the full extent, but at least we are getting some, some oversight of that physician, in, which I think in the long run actually adds to public safety. Is that a, a fair statement to make? I just want to make sure we're not thinking that just because we're not settling, we're doing a better job and we're keeping people safer. I'm not sure that's always the case. Well, I'm not going to respond to whether you're doing a better job or not. Um, right. From the, from the OAH point of view, uh, we offer opportunities to settle, and especially with cases that, that are the, the longer cause cases, the cases that are uh, three or more days, uh, we routinely set them for a settlement conference. Uh, and we offer the parties opportunities to come in and talk with one of our settlement judges uh, to, to discuss the settlement options. The issue of what authority is given to the Attorney General in that case is between the board and its lawyer, the Attorney General's office. Uh, and uh, that's something that I'm not going to get involved in. It, it I, I was just making a statement that, that I just didn't want people to have the wrong impression that, that necessarily um, a, a, a stricter adherence to guidelines is necessarily in every case going to be a better disciplinary situation, in, in my opinion at least. And, and, and from the Office of Administrative Hearings point of view, our way of expressing that is that we offer settlement opportunities as early as the parties are ready for them in the case. A case has to get to a certain point before the folks can talk about settlement because they have to know what the case is about. They have to have talked to witnesses and they have to sort of work the case up. But there's a point where it gets ripe and then it's ready for settlement and we try to make our judges available to help the parties at that point in time and as early as possible. Uh, because it saves everybody. You may get uh, quicker uh, public safety because you may, the, the negotiated settlement may be some form of probation. Um, you, 
and it will save cost for the board and for the parties because you don't have to take the case to trial. Um, so, do you know how much you said uh, traditionally it's been fifty-fifty? Your observation that it's less than fifty-fifty. Do you have a sense of? Yeah, uh, the the fifty percent number is based uh, was based on cases through. Uh, I, I think it was through the end of last fiscal year. So we don't have the current numbers to be, and, and we probably don't have enough cases yet to know whether it's a significant difference. Um. If there are no other questions from board members, I have one, one um, comment from a member of the public, Long Doe from California Medical Association. Good afternoon. My name is Long Doe. I'm an attorney with the California Medical Association, and, and I, I do appreciate Judge Alfred's uh, presentation about ISOs, and it's very, uh, we hope that it's very illuminating to you, but I did want to um, state our position on one issue that he mentioned, which is the standard of proof for uh, the ISO process under Government Code 11529. CMAs, it's, it's our belief um, that, that the standard for the ISO is clear and convincing uh, proof of evidence, which is a higher standard. Um, which is the same standard that would apply uh, on, in the accusation stage as well. And so I just wanted to make the board aware that that's our position. Thank you. What, what's the position? So there's a factual dispute between the two of you? Is that what you're saying? You're challenging the judge? <laughs> I, I, I certainly don't challenge the judges. I'm just stating our belief and our position. Uh, and and um, it's, it's certainly, if it were before us, that would be our ruling, but that's not what we do. Okay, thanks. Um, it's a CMA between board um, Any other comments from members of the public? If not, thank you so much, Judge. This is very helpful for us. Thank you. And I'm going to uh, move now to agenda item seven, board member communications with interested parties. Does anyone um, among the board members have anything to report and would anyone like um, a re refresher on what communication with interested parties is this would be something like meeting with the CMA or or uh, other associations that have common and concern about the the issues that come before the board about an issue that is coming, that is or is coming before the board. It's that not general communication. Right. Yeah. So talking about the weather wouldn't qualify, but if you're sitting down and talking about issues that may come before the board, that's something that you should uh, reveal to the other members in the public now. Ms. Wright, Dr. Gananadev, and then Ms. Yaroslavsky. Um, thank you very much. I had a meeting with the Charles Drew Medical Society, who has been represented here today, last Thursday. Uh, they did bring some concerns to me, which I have forwarded to the appropriate staff, and they've also been addressed here. Thank you. Dr. Gananadev. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I routinely get a meet with CMA members not related to board issues because I was past president of CMA but we don't discuss medical board, and some of the issues might come here, one of them being the proposition on MICRA. So I just want to let you know that these are the issues we talk about, but nothing related to medical board. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Uh, all my conversations are interesting, but um, I did want to report that I um, met with staff and with LACMA with the LA County Medical Association to work on uh, opportunities of further collaboration and engagement and education. So whether it ever comes before the board or not, I'm not sure, but in case it should, you should know. Um, and I also was, this is Denise Pines, I was also with Barbara for that meeting. Dr. Krauss? I have been uh, personally acquainted with uh, Senator Ted Liu since he first ran for assembly. Uh, and I know that uh, he was the one who put forward SB 62, which was of concern to us regarding coroner's reporting. And I had a uh, lunch meeting with him, not related to medical board matters, uh, but SB 62 did come up at lunch. And uh, I uh, asked if he would be willing to uh, sit with 
the medical board to uh, discuss new language to uh, get at the point of allowing the mechanism for coroners to report uh, opioid uh, deaths to the medical board, and he's very receptive to uh, having such a meeting. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. Gunanadev. Just as the, these uh, special Senate bills uh, were last year formulated, including uh, the Medical Board uh, Sunset Review Bill, I did meet with, uh, uh, with the Assembly BNP committee members, not as a Medical Board representative, but just as a practicing physician. Okay. So just let me suggest in the, in the issue of transparency, I understand what the rules are and the requirements are, and, and I appreciate that. Um, board members will see or, or elected officials will see me, and um, it happens that I talk about what I know best or what I don't know best, and um, it, it's never with any expectation. If I don't suggest here at this meeting that I had a conversation with, with 25 different people, it's not because I'm not thinking that it's important that you should know, but it's it's... I, I take my role and responsibility very seriously, but um, if I start to remember everybody I talked to, you we would not be finished here at five o'clock today. So I just want everyone to understand that I realize what what the expectation is for transparency. I um, I take my role and responsibility very seriously, but I, I just don't expect that you want to hear about every elected official that I happen to might maybe see in the course of what I wake up in the morning doing. So. I second that, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Then we're going to move on to agenda item um, eight, President's report. And in my role representing the medical board, I, I do want to report that on August 12th of this year, I met with Senator Liu, with Assemblywoman Bonilla, these are separate meetings, and Assemblyman Gordon to discuss SB 304, which is the medical board sunset bill, which was um, passed by the legislature and signed by the governor, um, renewing our, our um, authorizing legislation for a fully four years um, and accept, adopting um, uh, changes, some of which the medical board brought forward and some of which um, the BNP committees respectively recommended, and we're going to hear more about that today. In addition, I testified in front of the um, Assembly BNP committee on SB 304, um, and have um, and my testimony has been provided to all of you. I have met with Ms. Kirkmeyer and the executive staff of the medical board every two weeks to discuss work ongoing with the board and to assure that um, they have what they need from me and that I can support their efforts to continue to accelerate and improve performance of the board. In an effort to ensure um, the um, adequate time for conversation at board meetings. We've implemented a small change in our uh, proceedings this meeting, um, which we haven't actually experienced yet, but in the past staff have um, actually written reports and then read through their reports during the meeting. And in an effort to um, make, our, make the time for conversation and uh, answering of questions more more available, you'll see the written report in the um, materials. There's an executive summary with each item, highlighting the key points. And when the chiefs of licensing and enforcement make their reports, they will be highlighting the key points and available for questions. So hopefully that will facilitate our, our conversations and be interested in feedback from board members whenever you see an opportunity for us to do our work in a more effective way. Um, and that's it for now. Um, any questions for me? Any comments from members of the public? And if not, I'm going to move on to um, committee assignments, which is still under my um, president's report on page eight um, under tab 8 on pages 8A1 and 8A2, we have an updated committee roster. Dr. Diego has agreed to chair the licensing committee, which will be meeting again after the first of the year. We have three new board members and lots of opportunities for uh, committee assignments. And in the next few weeks, um, we will be contacting you and providing you with information about each of the board committees 
and asking for your interest in and willingness to serve um, on board committees. We, we try and get a fair amount of our work done in committee so that the board, the full board, is hearing the, the deliberations and conclusions and the work brought forward for board approval, but not actually going through all that w within a full board meeting. Um, and we currently need an additional member on the Appl application review committee and two members for the special programs committee. And as I said, we will be communicating with you about the purpose of these committees, the work that they do, and the frequency of their meeting. Um, and um, before our next board meeting, we'll be making assignments. Um, any questions? And yes, Dr. Just, Bianca. Just a point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. The panel be elected yours truly as the president and Ms. Pine says, as the chair and Ms. Pine says vice chair. Thank you. Oh, I um, apologize. Um, panel A, um, Barbie Yaroslavsky will chair it, and Dr. Lewis will co-chair. Vice President, President, sorry, whatever the term is this today. I think it's chair and vice chair. Vice, vice chair and yeah. chair, thank you. Table, vice table and chair. <laughs> chair. And you decided on the shape of the table, too. <laughs> we'll get to that in the next meeting. Okay. I'm going to turn the, the uh, microphone now over to Ms. Kirkmeyer for her interim executive director report. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, and um, I'm, it's funny, as we started this new process, I wrote a lot of things in my summary, and then as I thought of things and things that came up in the next two weeks, I have a little bit more than hopefully next time I'll have to report, so we'll see how this goes from here on out. Um, but if you'll turn in your packets to um, tab 9A on pages BRD 9A1 through 9A14, you will find um, my report, including a staffing report, administrative update, breeze update and budget update with the attached documents. I'm not gonna go over the summary except to state that at the end of last fiscal year, our reserve was at 5.4 months, but we're expected to be at 4.1 months at the end of this fiscal year. The other item from the executive summary and the attached documents is actually a mea culpa to Dr. Yip. Um, on the board member expenditure report, it states Miss Yip, and we've not only taken your degree from you, we turned you into your wife. So I apologize for that. <laughs> we'll get that right in the next agenda. Um, and then does anybody have any questions on any of the documents in there before I move on to just a few other brief updates? Okay, moving on. Um, one of the items I do want to touch on, and because we had public comment here this morning and just some other things that have come forward, is I would like to update the board on the Breeze project. Um, this project for some of the new members is the replacement of our legacy enforcement and licensing systems, and I think I've actually been in contact with some of the board members on the new website. Um, and some of its um, issues that we're running into. As the members know um, via an email to you, the system went live on October 8th. And as any of you who have implemented a large computer system that involves several entities, and those would be the boards under the other boards under the Department of Consumer Affairs, we've run into a few glitches. Um, at this time, we do not have as much functionality in the system as we're going to be expecting in the future. However, we're still working on the system, and we will be for basically the next six to eight months, I, I foresee, just in looking at some of the edits and the rollout on some of those edits. We expect that the end product, though, will have all the bugs worked out, and we will be providing both staff and the public with a system that meets all of the needs of both. So I did just want to give you an update on that. Um, at the next meeting in February, we're hoping to have a presentation from Linda Schneider from the Attorney General's Office regarding a recently completed lawsuit entitled the National Association of Optometrists and Opticians versus Harris. This lawsuit was filed um, based upon Business and Professions Code Section 655 and 2556, which prohibits business and financial relationships between optometrists and registered dispensing opticians. The courts upheld the constitutionality of those two sections. While the lawsuit was pending, neither the Board of Optometry nor the medical board who oversees registered dispensing opticians could pursue enforcement action based upon these sections. However, there's no longer a moratorium against the enforcement of those two code sections. 
The Attorney General's Office is working with several registered dispensing opticians to see if they will voluntarily bring their business models into compliance. Dr. Levine and board executive staff heard a presentation from Ms. Snyder, which fully explained the laws and history on this issue, and we both believe it would be beneficial for the members in the future. So we're gonna be having that at the next meeting, but until that time, I did wanna let you know that lawsuit has now been resolved. Okay, I also wanted to let the members know that we have worked with, oh, sorry. And just to clarify for the new members, um, the medical board is responsible for oversight of registered dispensing opticians. Um, arcane history, but it, it is our responsibility. So should, once the lawsuit is resolved, should there be enforcement actions, it would come under the medical board's purview. Okay, and then the other items I wanted to touch on, um, we have been working and I want to let the members know that we've worked with Purdue to obtain a list of their physicians in Region Zero. We also now have received a list from CVS, um, and they provided a list of physicians who they suspect may be overprescribing. We've been working and analyzing those lists and looking into physicians and determining the appropriate action for the future. Both of these lists will be treated as complaints and are considered confidential, and they will not be provided to anyone. So if anybody contacts you regarding those lists, please refer those calls to me so I can handle those calls. Um, we, as we analyze the data, we're looking to determine if these are physicians that we're already aware of or if there's someone that need, we need to open a new complaint and look into their prescribing practices and then as such proceed through the disciplinary process. Okay. We also have a meeting set up on October 31st with the California Department of Public <coughs> Health. We need to talk to them about the implementation of SB 304 and the new adverse <coughs> event reporting for ambulatory surgery centers, outpatient surgery settings. We also want to talk to them about some interpretations of law regarding outpatient surgery settings to ensure we all are on the same page at this time. <coughs> Lastly, we want to talk about adverse event reports that they have received in the last year. I also wanted to provide just a short update on the um, information in the past. At the last board meeting, I talked about meeting with corrections, and at that time, um, there was the investigative report about the female prisoners and tubal ligation. I wanted to let you know we did set up another meeting with the um, Department of Corrections, and since that time, we have received um, the names of the, the patients, the um, inmates, and we will be looking into those cases. But it, again, that will be an investigation, so we won't be able to provide information out about that. Those will be confidential. And then the last thing is actually something I think we're um, kind of excited about. We have been asked by the Assembly Business and Professions Committee staff um, who drug in, I think, a lot of other individuals now. We have quite a, a group coming. Um, on November 7th, we're going, November 6th, actually, we're going to be providing enforcement camp, basically Enforcement 101, to a lot of the consultants from the Senate and Assembly Business and Professions Committee and anybody else from those um, legislative offices that want to attend. We're going to be doing that. We've also invited um, some individuals from the Department of Consumer Affairs, including Mr. Gomez, and um, as well as some of their ledge staff as well. We really think it's very important for them as they analyze and look at any bill pertaining to the medical board that they understand how enforcement process works. And it's a great opportunity. And so we will be spending all day going through the enforcement process. And I believe that that's the end. So unless you have any questions. Okay, thank you, that's my report. Great, thank you, Ms. Kirkmeyer. Um, is there, um, so any board members have questions for Ms. Kirkmeyer? Any questions for member of the public? I have one slip, um, Yvonne Chung. Good morning, I'm Yvonne Chung with the California Medical Association. Uh, we just wanted to comment briefly on the Breeze update with respect to the physician renewal system being taken offline. We had received some calls from physicians who were basically kind of caught in that crack, as we would call it. Um, CHA, um, the California Hospital Association, has also been receiving some calls as well from their physicians. We realize that there are a lot of difficulties in bringing a new IT system online, and we appreciate those difficulties, and that you know the number of physicians that were directly affected by this is probably relatively small. However, in conversations with your staff, 
I did kind of bring to light an issue regarding how physicians are notified about these types of changes. Uh, our understanding is that the physicians were emailed for those who you have email addresses for and that the um, notification about the breeze change was posted on your website. However, um, I personally don't, I check the website a lot. I know probably most physicians do not unless they have a reason to. So uh, we'd like, we CMA and CHO would like to offer our assistance in the future um, publicizing these types of changes that affect a wide range of physicians. And while we appreciate the need to go paperless, in some cases we think that um, paper notification might actually um, still be needed, um, particularly for the physicians who may not be checking all their emails or, you know, they, may, they, they themselves may not be reading their emails. There's a lot of factors here. So we want to make sure that um, physicians know what they need to do. Um, in addition, this has also had a kind of a trickle-down effect to medical staffs and payers as well because as soon as a physician's license um, is no longer active, it triggers a whole bunch of other actions as well, which I think they were not aware that this was happening either. So you have medical staffs kind of scrambling because they have systems now that regularly check the medical board to see whether or not a physician's license is active. So you know, even though it may be an administrative problem, a, a whole, it ends up creating a lot more problems than I think were originally intended. So we just wanted to extend um, our desire to help publicize these kind of announcements. And we will be sending out announcements to our members as well. And we'll be posting something on our, our website advising physicians to renew their licenses as early as possible. Even though it's going to be fixed by November, I know that that's a projected date. So in the event that it goes on further, that physicians are aware. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Lewis. Oh, Ms. Chung. Uh, your uh, members who are caught in that crack, they are aware that there is a letter in lieu that can be issued that will give them that bridge. And uh, I just want to make sure you're aware there is. Right, we are aware of it. And I, we, are, we had previously posted something on our website back when this announcement was originally made. Um, and we have gone online and we updated that, letting physicians who have run into this issue that there are options that they shouldn't just kind of throw their hands up. Right. They should be sure to call the board. And there are ways that they can expedite the renewal of their license if, if needed. Good. Thank you. Dr. Gananadev. Uh, Actually, my medical staff got a couple of physicians in the same place, but medical board was very helpful on phone to resolve the issue so that uh, their privileges didn't get affected. So I think there is a way you can find out, uh, unfortunately, got to go circuitous route, but it still can be done. And our staff was very helpful. Thank you. If there are no other questions or comments, we move on to agenda item 10. And this is a request to obtain a, an attorney general legal opinion regarding medical assistant scope of practice. Uh, Ms. Kirkmeyer and Ms. Webb. Um, again, I'd like to ask the members to turn to page BRD 10-1 to 10-4. On June 26, 2013, Stephanie Nunez, executive officer of the Respiratory Care Board, sent me a letter requesting the medical board revise its frequently asked questions for medical assistance. She requested that we put in a question and answer, basically stating that medical assistants cannot perform any level, level of pulmonary function testing. Based upon this letter, we requested a board consultant review the letter and then, uh, and then request from Ms. Nunez. Our medical consultant did not agree with the request, stating that medical assistants could perform some of the testing that the respiratory care board was saying they could not. Therefore, our legal counsel, Ms. Webb, reviewed the matter. Upon Ms. Webb's review, we agree that in order to resolve this issue, we need a legal opinion from the Attorney General's office. Since this issue is between two boards under the Department of Consumer Affairs, the opinion would not be appropriate coming from that department, which is why we are asking for this to be given to the Attorney General's office. I will hand this off to now to Ms. Webb to provide the information on this matter. So there or hopefully you've reviewed my memo that I prepared and, and uh, that Ms. Kirkmeyer referred you to. I regret that the formatting is a little off, but uh, I did try to make the issue clear and refer you to the statutes and regulations that apply to medical assistance. Uh, upon my review, it appears that the basic screening tests for pulmonary function are in line with the other functions that medical assistants are specifically permitted to do. For example, they can perform electrocardiograms, 
electroencephalograms and plethysmography tests, but they can't do full body plethysmography. Uh, if they can perform these types of tests and pulmonary function screening tests, the basic level, are in line with these and can be performed safely and appropriately, then it would create a burden and a barrier to the, the a patient's access to care by forcing them to have to go to a respiratory care therapist uh, for every time this needs to be done. Uh, especially when, when there's not a specific prohibition in the statutes or regulations for them doing it. So because there's a conflict between the boards, if members agree that, uh, well first, if, if members think that the basic level of screening cannot be done safely, then they should instruct staff to put the, the proposed frequently asked question on our website. If the members want to have this reviewed and have an opinion by an attorney general, um, then that's, there needs to be a motion in support by the board to make that request to the attorney general. So um, any questions for Dr. Gnadev, Ms. Yaroslavsky? I, Ms. Webb, by personal feeling, I, I don't think basic screening tests are any more difficult than the basic electrocardiogram or uh, plethysmography of one area of the body. So I don't feel uh, uncomfortable that uh, the medical assistant should do these things. They should be able to, under the supervision of physician or uh, physician assistants or one of the nurse practitioners, that's what they are under the supervision. So that's why I think I, I am with you on this. I, I would agree, this is standard practice in every primary care office in the management of mild, moderate, mi even mild and moderate asthma. Parents do spirometry with their children. Um, I, I certainly. I, I personally don't know what the tests are, or what they do, or what the outcomes are supposed to be, but it seems to me that we have always had the rule and regulation, not maybe regulation, but as long as you can do it safely and you've been trained to do it and it's within the parameters of, of uh, supervision or the instruction, direct instruction by a uh, medical doctor that it's okay. So I'm, I'm not quite clear as to why they don't want their people doing this. I mean, I, I'm. So the respiratory therapy board. Right. Their argument is this is the purview of respiratory therapists. Oh, they just, okay, so it's a, it's a, it's uh, a territory scope of, kind of, it's a territory. It's a kind scope of, pr a dispute about scope of practice. And I think as, okay. as um, Ms. Webb's memo clearly laid out. Exactly. The, the fact that, that overlap, the, the, the things that can be done by multiple. There's a responsibility overlay and there's shared yeah, responsibilities. Right, scope, over, this, overlap. scope overlay. Yeah. And I think uh, Ms. Webb yeah. explained that very well, so I wanted to support uh, us to do that. Dr. Gananadev. There, there are some where only respiratory therapy can do, that is total lung volumes. Yes. There are some part of, these are not screening spirometry. Screening is a basic pulmonary function test which any licensed healthcare, any provider can do, and actually parents do at home. So that's why it just uh, doesn't make sense to me. So do you want a motion Dr. to? Lu what do you want? Yeah, the um, physician, I assume in each office, has a standard operating procedure. The medical assistants are, are performing their tasks under the purview of the physician. So in that office, it's ultimately the physician's responsibility for those people in his, his or her staff that perform these functions. I'm not sure why, I guess we're getting involved because there's a physician oversight for this. Is that why the medical board is asked to comment? Um, but I think that as long as the physician has oversight, it should be a, a formidable task. We're actually not asked to comment. We were asked to put this in our FAQs for medical assistance that they could not do them. Hmm. And that's when we saw it um, and decided that, you know, at this time, based on opinions that we have, we're, 
we're not going to come to a resolution on this matter and therefore we're asking for a legal opinion because that way both sides can stand by that right can I have a motion um, so moved. Se second second um, any further comment by board members um, just that I know we're a PA board we have uh, nurse practitioner board do we have it MA, do we do have an existing MA set of criteria? What extent would they do? Medical assistant. Medical assistant. We, we have it in both law, in both statute and regulation as to some of the duties that they can perform. And um, so both of those are in there right now, but it's not for every different function that they can do. It's kind of a high level, you know, they can do this including but not limited to and give some of the higher level ones. So Ooh, it is in ours. It's under the medical board. Medical assistants are under the medical board. We don't license them. We don't certify them. Um, but because they're under the supervision of a physician, they do therefore fall kind of under the medical board and they are in our statute. Okay, so, so maybe it's time for myself also to read all those and see if we need update. It come to my mind that uh, actually there's a lawsuit involving urologists that the MA do in and out calf, and the lawyer saying the MA should not do in and out calf. So there's a, a urology group of 50 physicians sent a letter to all urologists say all the MA should not do in and out calf because of such a lawsuit. That as you say, parents are doing in and out calf, patients are doing in and out calf. Why the MA cannot do in and out calf? So I think it's time probably to, for me myself or some member, me look at what should be updated in the so-called MA scope of function. And there's no way to ever fully anticipate all of the specific tasks and so categories, I guess, of, of tasks and tasks that are comparable in terms of requirement or what's, what's essentially listed in the, in the legislation. So, um, oh, uh, thank you. Any members of the public want to comment on this? I don't have any slips on this. Yes. Pardon my ignorance, perhaps it's already been mentioned and I didn't catch it, but I'm a little confused in terms of what I'm hearing is a discussion on whether or not a particular procedure will be allowed to be done by medical assistants or RTs and that the decision needs to be made based on legal review. Is there any place in this process for there to be medical input as to what does the uh, pulmonologist, what did the pulmonologist feel is most appropriate? Is there any place for medical input into the decision that's going to be arrived at on this medical procedure? Is it limited to what the legal input is? Because I'm, I'm only hearing the request to get legal input on where we legally stand and it doesn't appear to me that we're including a medical recommendation from pulmonology specialist or other physicians that routinely do these types of procedures on what do they believe to make that decision. So the purpose of bringing this to the board is that if the medical board, which is essentially accountable for oversight of the, the Medical Practice Act, did not agree that this was appropriate, then there would be no legal, uh, uh, no request for a legal opinion. The members of the board, if they vote to allow or to ask Ms. Webb to, to uh, and the RT board to take this to the AG's office, it is because the medical board believes that this is within the purview of a medical assistance, assistant. Okay. So that, is that the Yes, helpful? that answers it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, so I'm going to call the. Any other public comment? Public comment on this. Uh, oh. Yes, um, and please come forward and um, state your name. If you could. S I don't know. Hi, my name is Deborah Rotenberg. I'm an attorney with Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California. I just submitted a slip. I'm sorry if it hasn't. Okay. 
Uh, we, we would just welcome very much if the medical board would review and revisit the um, Q&As on medical assistance. We think that it's severely outdated, and we're noticing that other regulatory entities, such as the Board of Pharmacy, are now weighing in on scope of practice related to medical assistance in a way that may not be consistent with what the medical board would believe. So to the extent that Planned Parenthood can help, uh, we employ medical assistants, we train them in our clinics, uh, we rely on them, and we very strongly support you revisiting the Q&As that are on your website. Thank you very much. Hmm. Seeing no other um, public comments, um, all in favor of the, the proposed motion um, to seek a legal opinion resolving the dispute over um, medical assistance performance of these screening procedures, screening procedures um, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much, Ms. Kirkmeyer and Ms. Webb. Uh, moving on to agenda item number 11, Federation of State Medical Board reports. I'm, Ms. Kirkmeyer is going to provide this report. Okay. Well, in looking in and um, hearing from the Federation, they've actually been very busy. In July, the Board of Directors approved its final policy entitled Model Policy for the Use of Opioid Analgesics in the Treatment of Chronic Pain. This new policy will supersede their 2004 um, model policy. It provides guidelines to help physicians um, who prescribe opioid analgesics um, do so in full compliance with state and federal regulations, accepted clinical practice, and in a manner that is safe and reduces risk. They also adopted a, a policy entitled My Model Policy on Data 2000 and Treatment of Opioid Addiction in the Medical Office. These two policies provide important guidance for clinicians as the medical community continues to face the challenges of treating chronic pain while confronting the public health threat of opioid misuse, abuse, and addiction. The Federation did seek input from state boards, experts in pain medicine, and in addition, a diverse group of stakeholders and national professional organizations. The board's prescribing task force will be reviewing these two new documents when revisiting the pain, board's pain management guidelines. The policies have been reviewed by Enforcement Deputy Chief Ms. Sweet, who believes that they will be very helpful for the task force. The Federation also continues to work on the Interstate Compact for Medical Licensure. And then on October 7th, they actually issued a press release regarding moving forward with eight consensus principles used to shape a model compact. They established it an expander, expanded interstate compact task force made up of representatives from state medical boards, the Federation, and consultants from representatives um, and expertise in state compacts. They have finalized a set of recommendations for an initial framework for interstate medical licensure compact for states to um, in input. In general, this compact recommendations envision a, model co a compact model that would maintain state authority and control, which is something important to us, establish high standards for physician el eligibility, ensure a well-coordinated and fairly applied system of oversight and discipline. An effective interstate compact must include a cooperative system of information sharing and rapid adjudication of disciplinary issues between states. The Federation is beginning the drafting phase for a compact, and I have some information I will be forwarding out to the members on that interstate compact and the release that was just issued from the Federation. Just a clarification for our new members. The issue of interstate compact came up, and this relates to the next issue, which is telemedicine, um, in that the telecommunications industry is very interested in the, the um, adoption of the telecommunications technology by the healthcare enterprise, particularly for um, telemedicine um, cons con consulting and care delivery, and they would like to see the elimination of state licensure and its replacement with a, f a national licensure. When this was um, discussed at the Federation meeting last year in, or six months ago, there was not a, f a single state medical board that felt that they could truly enforce public safety and, and consumer protection if the licensure and enforcement were separated in terms of practice of medicine in the state. And so 
the, the pathway that the Federation chose was to develop an, a, a vol an optional interstate compact, compact that two states could choose to adopt, similar to compacts in other areas such as water rights. Um, there are apparently many other areas of, of enterprise where there are interstate compacts, and California has many of these in place. But the voluntary participation by two states in an interstate compact that would allocate um, licensure and enforcement issues and enable the state to carry out its um, duties to protect, to protect its consumers um, if it chose to do so while allowing telemedicine across state lines. This is of great interest to some of the, the rural states. Um, Wyoming is an example where access to some specialists is very limited and they would like to, t to take advantage of this. It would be entirely voluntary. It would be up to the states to work this out. And then right in line with that, um, the Federation is working um, on deals with the newly introduced federal bill. On September 10th, um, representatives Devin Nunez and Frank Poloni um, introduced H.R. 3077, and it's entitled the Telemedicine for Medicare Act of 2013. The bill allows for a Medicare provider licensed in one state to treat any Medicare beneficiary in another state via telemedicine without requiring additional state licensure where the patient is located. And as all of you know, right now, if an individual is in Kansas providing telemedicine to a California patient, that individual has to be licensed in California even though they're in Kansas. Under this legislation, the provider would remain under the jurisdiction of the state medical board where he or she is licensed for the purposes of discipline, effective eliminating the practice of medicine occurring where the patient is located under these circumstances. To date, the bill has 17 bipartisan co-sponsors and it is expected that now that the federal government shutdown has ended, there will be, will be a strong push in the House of Representatives to pass this legislation. Ms. Samoza and I will be working with the Federation to reach out to Congressman Nunez, I hope I'm saying that right, office, and then other California offices on this issue to help them understand the issues surrounding enforcement under this model. And we'll really be reaching out to Negretti McLeod because she um, knows us very well from being the Senate Business and Professions Chair at one point. Um, so again, I will forward information on both of these items to you um, after the board meeting. The Federation also has a notice and is seeking resolutions by February 24th, 2014 for their annual meeting. If any member has any resolution they would like to be put forward, please contact me to discuss your idea so it can be developed and presented at the February 13, 14 board, uh, on February 13th and 14th board meeting for approval. Any questions before we move on? Okay. Again, just one clarifying comment. Um, and if this board meeting runs late, it's my fault. Um, one of the challenges is that for a physician, the standard has always been that the, that the practice of medicine is where the patient is. And every state has very different requirements around what constitutes safe medical practice. And to um, the, the, the one concern is certainly jurisdiction shopping that the state, um, the, weakest link. the state that has the fewest requirements and the weakest enforcement, and if there are no prohibitions against practicing across state lines, um, it, really, it, it really binds the hands of um, the state in terms of ensuring that physicians are practicing up to the standards that the state has, through its legislature, has, has promulgated. <coughs> All right. Moving on then to B. Um, the Federation is also seeking nominations for elective offices. Um, I sent out information to all members regarding these positions and I, to date I have not heard from any member who wishes to run for office at this time. Okay. All right. <laughs> Oh, come on, Dr. Lewis, no. <laughs> yeah, right. um, the Federation is al also seeking individuals who are interested in serving with committees within the Federation. Two members have stated their interest in being appointed to a committee following the April 2014 annual meeting. Dr. Levine and Dr. Krauss are both interested in being appointed to the Ethics and Professionalism Committee. 
In addition, Dr. Krause is interested in being appointed to any special committee which may be convened in relation to advocacy, government affairs, and policy. I'd like to ask for a motion to approve a preparation of a letter of recommendation and support for appointment of Dr. Levine and Dr. Kraus to the Ethics and Professional Committee and Dr. Kraus to any special committee established by the Federation in those areas. So moved. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? I guess we. Oh, no, no. Public comments. Oh, public comments. comments. Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, great. I want to briefly ask the board members to return to Section 9B. Uh, uh, this is just a confirmation of 2014, the second two meeting dates in 2014. We previously approved the first two meetings of the year. It's the July and October meeting dates, just to be sure. Um, we need a vote on these so that we can proceed. What page are you on? Nine. It's nine. It's section nine. Nine B one. Nine B one. Green. Nine B. Oh, it's the last page in section nine. After the green sheet. Uh, I don't yeah. know. Green sheet. That's why I asked. Oh. The oh wait, I have a green sheet. I think you could, do. Uh, 13th, for February 14th was the best day we could to come up in February. <laughs> yes. So bring your Valentine. <laughs> but we'll have chocolate hearts for everybody who comes. <laughs> Sam, you read the dates. That, yeah. Just for, for those who are having trouble finding it, it's July 24th and 25th, and that meeting is in Sacramento, and then October 23rd and 24th, and that's in San Diego. And you're also approving the locations as well. So. Which is how we ended up in Riverside. <laughs> Dr. Gonadeff and I talk, and he kindly allows me to <laughs> alternate with him with the San Diego Riverside sessions, if the rest of the board concurs. <laughs> but we'll vote on that every year. <laughs> okay. Any concerns about the dates? If not, um, can I have a motion to approve these dates? Motion approved. Second. Second. Uh, public comment? Seeing none, all, of, all, all in favor say aye. 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 Op opposed? Great. Thank you. All right, now um, I'm going to next turn to um, update on our, on our enforcement committee that was held yesterday. And I'm going to turn this over to Gana Dr. Gananadev, who will um, introduce the presentation and then introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Enforcement Committee actually had a fairly large and ambitious agenda, but we finished in time. Not like Panel B today. Um, you know, the first agenda item, we heard a presentation from Interim <coughs> Executive Director, Ms. Kirschmeyer, and Mr. Kidani and Mr. Gomez from uh, Department of Consumer Affairs. Regarding a transition of the MBC investigators to the Division of Investigation at DCA per SB 304. This will, this will involve Mr. Gomez, Ms. Kirschmeyer, Ms. Threadgill, and Mr. Kidani as a work as a collaborative team. Mr. Gomez provided a chronology and, of the transition plan and both he and Mr. Kidani indicated they will be reporting the progress of the transition at each quarterly board meeting as they want this to be a transparent and collaborative process. We were shown very helpful charts and uh, explain how the <coughs> transition will work. After I complete my update, I will ask Ms. Kirschmeyer, Mr. Kadani, and Mr. Gomez to come forward and provide the members who are not in the audience yes, uh, attendance yesterday with an opportunity to hear from them on this transition and ask questions. Then the next item we heard from Ms. Sweet, who recapped the accomplishments of the enforcement program uh, in the past six years. Despite the numerous obstacles, including the loss of 656 work hours per investigator due to furloughs, hiring freezes, and other challenges, the program saw some impressive productivity gains, including but not limited to, and these are important for the rest of the board to hear and the public to hear, 351% increase in criminal referrals, mm -hmm. 
100% increase in uh, license restrictions and suspensions, a 39% increase in completed investigations, and a 36% increase in the referrals to the office of the uh, Attorney General, all the while, in spite of furloughs, reducing the case investigation times by 15%. The next agenda item, a discussion on suggested improvement to the enforcement program was deferred to a, pu a future meeting till the transition of the investigators to the DCA is uh, streamlined. We will then be able to evaluate the enforcement program and make specific suggestions and solutions for the improvement. Then Ms. Feet provided uh, update on the progress of the overprescribing task force, uh, strike force, Operation RX. Uh, the unit currently is investigating 27 cases. Since the last board, in, board meeting, four physicians and one physician assistant have been arrested and criminal charge, arrested and criminal charges are pending. They have completed three search warrants 15 undercover operation and have procured over 2,000 physical prescriptions as a part of these investigations. There are numerous search warrants in the planning stages. Ms. Sweet explained how overprescribing allegations are fraught with challenges because of the sheer volume of the material necessary for the successful prosecution. Ms. Sweet also gave an update on the next expert reviewer meet, uh, training, which is scheduled for Saturday, November 2nd at UC San Diego. 10 hours of CME will be provided to the participants who attend the training and complete the sample expert opinion. Excellent speakers have been lined up and board members are encouraged to attend if possible. And I'm actually requesting that uh, if any board members can make it, uh, it will be great because yours truly uh, is in uh, Philadelphia at AAMC meeting, that's why I can't go. Then Mr. K, Ms. Katie K, then provided us an overview of the probation monitoring unit. Currently, there are 561 physicians on probation. During the past two fiscal years, 58% of the probationers have successfully completed probation. The most common violations leading to probation are gross negligence and incompetence, including inappropriate prescribing violations. Ms. KD presentation then focused on several of the conditions most commonly ordered as a part of the probation, the clinical, uh, clinical training requirement and biological fluids testing, et cetera. And that concludes my update, and I will ask uh, Ms. Kirschmeyer, Mr. Kadan, Kadani, and Ms. G Mr. Gomez to proceed. Well, I apologize to the members that went through this yesterday, but for those that weren't in attendance, I'll try to make it brief. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So I'm just going to go quickly over. Um, I'm not going to go over what the bill did. I think um, for the most part, everybody knows that transitions are investigators, medical consultants, and their support staff no later than July 1st of 2014. Um, to the Department of Consumer Affairs Health Quality Investigative Unit of um, the Division of Investigation. And so how does that impact the board, its processes, and basically vertical enforcement? So what I've done is I've prepared slides, and I'm sorry, it's, in the, it's actually in the enforcement packet. So in your packet, if you can go to the enforcement committee and turn to page ENF 4-6. And this is the current enforcement process prior to Senate Bill 304 passage. So you'll see on this chart, the complaint is received in the medical board. It is basically triaged. If they determine that the complaint needs to be investigated, it goes out to our district offices. And they investigate that case working with the Attorney General's office through BEP. And then at the disposition of that case, it's reviewed by the chief, deputy chief, supervising investigators, and it could have several outcomes at that time. The case could be closed. Again, it's being reviewed. It could be referred for a citation and fine, and those informal conferences on those citations and fines are held by our chief of enforcement or supervising investigator. It could be re referred for a pre-accusation PLR, and that negotiation happens by the chief of enforcement and is processed by her, and she signs off on those. 
And then it could be referred to the district attorney's office and our office of standards and training, which is a unit within our um, enforcement um, district offices. They um, track that, it's in our headquarters, but there are sworn staff that do that. Or it could be referred to the attorney general's office for appropriate action. So once that refers over to the AG's office for the prosecution of the case, the health quality enforcement section takes it. They would file those initial pleadings and go through the disciplinary process. But it's important to point out that our chief of enforcement, as well as our deputy chief and supervising investigators are the ones that provide that settlement authority that Dr. Lewis was talking about earlier today with um, Judge Albert. So then once that's completed and the final decision is rendered, um, the stipulated decision or the proposed decision would go to the board for final review. So that's the current process and as you can see, for the most part, is it's the Medical Board of California who's making all the decisions as well as the Attorney General's office with their assistance. I do wanna point out that the items in red, those are items that actually where the board has control or the items that are currently performed by positions within the medical board that are gonna be transferred over to the HQIU. So this is what the process looks like basically with the, um, after SB 304 happens. So again, the complaint comes in, however, when it needs to be investigated, it's gonna be referred over to the Health Quality Investigative Unit. That group is gonna be the one that reviews it um, does the investigation and once they make that disposition because these individuals are now employees of the Department of Consumer Affairs they're not employees of the medical board they don't have the authority to make the final decision for the board so that will be referred back to the board the board will review that case and make sure that they approve of that final disposition of the case not only will we, we need that done at the medical board, the other items that are done currently with um, Ms. Threadgill as the chief of enforcement will have to be done now at the medical board. So that would be the informal conferences would need to be performed by medical board, the negotiation of the PLR, and then we would have to monitor and track that criminal activity. As well, at, during the prosecution of that case, it, our in-house um, individual will have to be the one that, who is reviewing the settlement authority and, and approving the settlement <coughs> authority. So that's kind of how you can see the difference there between pre and post of SB 304. <coughs> and there's another chart in your um, packet on page 4-8 that really talks about the vertical enforcement process. And basically what's important to see here is, as you can see, you have MBC and AG's office. And the, M the medical board and AG's office work hand in hand during the investigation. So as it continues down through the process, those are the two entities. However, if you turn to 4-9, and I'm sorry, this, I don't have this up here. Are you guys okay just with your packets there? Can I just get, okay. So if you look at 4-9 in your packet, now you'll see that the, in the middle of the medical board and the attorney general's office is HQIU. So they're the group now, again, they're gonna be the ones that are working vertical enforcement with the attorney general's office. It won't be the medical board. So as you continue through the process, it's gonna be those investigators of the department that are working hand in hand with the AG's office. And again, once it get, comes down to the end, the medical board will be making the final decision, having that authority, as well as the board itself will continue to make its final um, decisions on all of those. So are there any questions on how it impacts you? And the changes? Okay, with that, I'm gonna kick it off to um, Mr. Gomez and Mr. Kadani, um, just for some brief comments as well. Ms. Kirkmeyer, thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair, um, Mr. Ganadev, thank you for um, providing myself and my staff the opportunity to brief the committee uh, yesterday. Um, being brief, um, I'm Awit Kadani, Chief Deputy Director of the Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, to my far left, uh, Michael Gomez, uh, Deputy Director of Enforcement and Chief of the Division of Investigation of uh, Department of Consumer Affairs. 304 was signed into law by the governor and we are where we are now. And what I, what I stressed to the committee yesterday was it's imperative for the Medical Board of California as well as the Department of Consumer Affairs who are, who are family to work together to um, execute this 
uh, the best way possible. What that requires is communication on both parts. The Department of Consumer Affairs has a tremendous amount to learn from the medical board. The enforcement staff, you guys have medical consultants that we will um, depend on. You guys have processes that we will depend on, and vice versa. There are, way, there are things that my colleague uh, to my left does, relationships that, that um, he has that we all collectively can leverage. This is a process that, um, if done correctly, can, can uh, make our collective organizations a better product on, on the back end. The, the process by which we get there, my colleague is gonna walk us through that. Um, the importance of that is why the department has created a transition team. We, we don't know what we don't know just yet. We know there are gonna be some challenges as there is with any uh, reorganization. The department just um, um, landed the um, GRP2, the governor's reorganization. We did that successfully. There were some headaches, there were some problems as with any project or, or reorganization, but through thoughtful process, thoughtful planning, and, and ways to mitigate you know, uh, problems, um, we got through it. That same process will be applied here. Uh, project plan, dates, making sure that, every, that we are transparent. I, want, I do wanna stress to this board, as your partner, it is my commitment to you to be as transparent as possible. Uh, where we are on the project, we will give updates to you. Um, I also want to stress to you that holding ourselves accountable, the way, the way I wanna measure success, success is the current numbers that you guys have with regard to enforcement, your metrics. I wanna hold ourselves accountable based on your current numbers. How are we gonna get this right? How, we, how can we say that what my colleague and myself do post-implementation is right? The only way we could do that is look at the current numbers and say, you know what, we need to improve here, or we missed something here, or good, we're getting it right. We collectively have <coughs> done this right. How can we now push ourselves a little bit more and, and um, improve? It's always a path to improvement. Um, last, I do want to um, stress is a way to improve vertical enforcement. There are, I, I'm a true believer that there are always ways to improve. Vertical enforcement is extraordinarily important, and the law is the law. The law did not change, and vertical enforcement, the way the spirit of the law is, as soon as that complaint is filed. <coughs> The Attorney General's Office is our partner throughout that process. That is my intent, that is my colleague's intent, and we plan on leveraging every resource at our disposal to make sure that we improve and continue to improve uh, the vertical enforcement process. Uh, with that, I submit the questions and turn it over to my, to my colleague. Yes, ma'am. So, acknowledging the fact that we're a consumer board and a lot of times the public comes and asks us questions or decides to make a complaint about, say, an investigator or a medical consultant, and they're now your staff, right. who, who do we then, and this may be you know, kind of an abstract question, but who do, we re, who do we then direct, do we redirect them to the Department of Consumer Affairs or how do we handle that? There's, there's three areas that I want you to, to kind of uh, focus on in terms of where you would go. You, if it's the intake, the complaint area, that would be with the board. If it's an investigation, right. that would be with the division. But in the investigation stage, we don't, we don't disclose that. And then, but, okay. and then after the investigation stage is what we call the adjudication stage, which is at the Attorney General's office. Oh, let me rephrase my okay, question then, yeah. So I meant if a consumer has a complaint about a staff person, not about some, not a doctor. I'm sorry if that I'm was sorry. not clear at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I meant a staff. It, it, I, it I would depend on the, the staff. It, it, okay. If the staff person is a peace officer, uh -huh. uh, the Peace Officer Bill writes, uh, uh, there, there's a formal process that you must follow in writing under penalty of perjury to, to invoke that complaint, just like a regular police officer or a sheriff's deputy in any city or county. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, the complaint has to be very formal. It'd be almost like making a complaint against a physician. Okay. There's due process that's involved. Okay. Okay. Ms. Kirchmeyer, would it be, would it be rational since P 
people will not, not naturally think of us first, that perhaps all this could be triaged through the medical board in some fashion since Thank you. make it easier for the consumers. Ms. Yes, Yaroslavsky, did you? That was uh, Dr. Bishop is exactly. Did you the punch once? Uh, absolutely. I think that, that we all have to remember, even though what we're doing is trying to make this a more effective and efficient process, we still, as members of the medical board, if we receive any information or are asked any kind of questions that we are any kind of clarity, it goes directly to our staff. That that's that's where we go to. We're not the conduit. We're not the efficiency expert here to make it, you know, for any other department. We're here for the medical board, and therefore, I think that the expectation is that we would go to directly to our executive officer or Pre executive precisely. Officer. That and I was just, look, just looking at Kim that's, and said that's so, what we should do. Because it sounded like okay, you're now you're the employer, so we're just kind of de facto. They're contracting here. with us, right? They're, right, they're our, right. But okay. you know, for the sake of, you know, how it, it's how, how you would yeah, right. how, how you would prefer that's perception. I just wanted clarification. Exactly. Okay. But exactly. specifically for investigator um, complaints, there is a specific okay. process that we'll have to go through his office, so we will be referring yes. to anything like that. But if it's regarding the complaint, the outcome of the complaint, we would more than likely work with the Division of Investigation to respond. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, by way of introduction, a, a good afternoon, members of the Medical Board of California. Yesterday we had a wonderful uh, uh, discussion, and uh, my name is Michael Gomez. I'm the Deputy Director for the Division of Investigation and Enforcement Programs for the Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, just by uh, a brief uh, bio, uh, I've been in a uh, law enforcement professional for 25 years. Half of that time has been as an executive, as a, a bureau chief with the Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training for the Department of Justice, and uh, almost a decade as chief of the Division of Investigation for the Department of Consumer Affairs. So as we, yesterday when we had the discussion members, we uh, went, walked through two things in particular. Who is the Division of Investigation? You know, what, what is this, this unit where the Health Quality Investigations Unit will reside? And the second was the transition plan itself. The Division of Investigation is the general law enforcement arm of the Department of Consumer Affairs. Similar to the Medical Board investigators under 830.3 of the California Penal Code, they are peace officers and have the general law enforcement authorities and all the authorities of every board, bureau, and commission of the Department of Consumer Affairs in terms of investigating and prosecuting those violations. We have a field operations division. If you, just go, oh, you already did it, Kim. You're ahead of me. Um, we have a field operation division that somewhat mirrors the enforcement unit of the Medical Board of California in that we have a headquarters operation. We then have field office, a, a, a command structure, that uh, in this particular example on the screen, we have eight field offices where we have investigators that are located throughout California, the North, the South, Central Valley. So what we currently do is our mission is to effectively investigate and enforce in conjunction with our client boards, uh, the, the prosecution with the Attorney General's Office of violations of law to the respective practice acts of the various, various boards and bureaus. So we have a close relationship with the boards particularly the, the healing arts boards. Um, about 90% of our work is, uh, is uh, healing arts uh, violations and, and quality of care uh, investigations. The, the, um, the division prides itself largely on our, our ability to, uh, to not only partner with our respective uh, enforcement staffs at the various boards, but also to communicate with them you know, the stages of the investigation to report them, to them, uh, case aging, and particularly, um, you know, the cost of the investigations as we go forward. So there's some check and balance in terms in communication in terms of the flow or the movement of those cases. The, in your, in, uh, in attachment H of your binder, I think it's still agenda four, Kim? Uh, enforcement. Uh, agenda four is the proposed organizational chart implementing the transfer of the SB 304 employees, uh, the investigators, the medical consultants, and the, um, the support staff. And as you will see, the prior org chart showed D of I without HQIU, and now this one shows in red the addition of HQ, the Health Quality Investigations Unit. I want to clarify that as of July 1st of next year, we are not considering any movement, relocation, moving of any staff, that are currently employed by the Medical Board of California. The, the existing district offices, the work, the procedures, everything that they're currently doing will remain the same until we go through the transition plan and determine <coughs> what efficiencies 
or what other improvements we can make throughout the process, including working with the Attorney General's Office in the vertical enforcement and prosecution uh, protocols and authorities that we have working with the board. What I'd like to do now is go to the transition plan itself. Uh, I don't, I, the, there's a more detailed uh, uh, plan in your attachment A, in your binder. Uh, this is more of a, of, a, of a highlighted area, but the essential components of that are that, that we have created a transition team. That transition team includes the Chief Deputy of the Department of Consumer Affairs, Awet Kadani, Kim Kirkmeyer, Renee Threadgill, our Deputy Directors of Admin, Legislative and Policy Review, and our Public Affairs uh, Deputy Director. What we haven't put in here, and you know, uh, boss, I guess we got we got to consider this: is we need to look at at uh, the inclusion of uh, of Gloria Castro uh, at some point in and where that might fit as well. Because I've had some brief conversations just in the last 24 hours with her, and you know, she's she has actually uh, added some uh, very valuable information in terms of the perspective that we probably ought to be looking at. But but it is the transition team. The next step you'll see in the highlighted areas of all these. Uh, monthly events is that there will be assignment of ownership of the components of the plan to members of the transition team. For instance, vertical prosecution would be Renee Threadgill, myself, the chief deputy if he chooses, uh, Gloria Castro, and, uh, and your interim executive officer, Kim, uh, to work through you know, the components of what needs to be assessed and what we need to address in terms of, of that particular step. And then we have constant transition meetings with the leadership of the Medical Board of California, the Attorney General's Office, and DFI responsible for implementing the vertical enforcement model uh, as required by law. And then we go through almost continuous meetings, uh, uh, meeting confirmed with labor groups and employees, sp specifically the town hall meetings we're going to have with the Medical Board employees, uh, hearing from them what their ideas might be, what their operations needs are, uh, almost a needs assessment of of what the transition team needs to look at in terms of making this seamless, transparent, and more importantly, how do we make the operation better and looking at our metrics as my chief deputy just uh, um, uh, mentioned that we are accountable to not only the board but also to the public and what we're doing. Uh, and then we, plot, we, we want to make sure that the board understands that we will provide at every board quarterly meeting an uh, update on the, the, the completion and, and what we've discovered in the transition plan itself. Um, this process attempts to implement a seamless transition. Uh, reporting relationships of the FB, NBC staff and the D Division of Investigation and our management protocols in terms of the investigation partnership with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, lastly, um, I do look forward to, to working with uh, uh, Kim Kirkmeyer and I, and I will tell you as I, as I said yesterday that uh, Kim, thank you for being, uh, taking the initiative just to re outreach to me. Even a couple of days after the bill was signed, I think you surprised me. I was, I was <laughs> but uh, I do appreciate that. And that goes to the, the cooperative spirit that in the partnership we have as consumer protection agencies, that we are one family. We have a, a, a very parallel mission and a collaborative uh, uh, spirit in terms of going forward. I can answer any questions if you have any. Any questions for Mr. Gomez or Mr. Adani from the board members? If there aren't any, I just want to thank Mr. Kadani and Mr. Gomez. And we are, I'm looking at on the, from the enforcement committee side and uh, to that the, this board function will not change. A part of the medical board staff is being transferred along with the finances, the amount which goes with it, people and the money are going to DCA. And in the end, it has to work smoothly. And we talked about this yesterday. Yes, they are on the spot. We expect them to perform because in my mind, it is, uh, putting in simple term, it's not exactly that, but uh, by statute, contracted service. By statute, it's not optional, but statute, but it's a contracted service, so we expect it to work. And uh, when we need improvements, we expect those improvements to come too. So I, uh, I think I'm pretty confident it will work through the way already 
four of them started to work together, that including uh, Ms. Threadgill. So, so this, this is why I think we, but we need to keep an eye on. We need to get the reports, routine reports, and uh, we need to come up with, ad with improvements and then work with them. Thank you. Exactly, and, and just a, a final comment. I wanted to, in just talking to Laura Sweet and uh, <coughs> Renee Threadgill yes, last night and just throughout the, the last 24 hours, I want to let you know that you have some <coughs> very talented investigators in, in the Medical Board of California. I'm looking forward to being their leader and working with you, the Attorney General's office, and, uh, and really reminding everybody, and in, in terms of the peace officer, our code of ethics is you know, what our fundamental duties are as, as peace officers enforcing and embracing vertical enforcement in California for the best interests of the consumers. Well, thank you very much, and we expect you to take good care of these very special people. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, I have one comment from a member of the public on this agenda item. Um, Lisa McGifford, you guys can go ahead and sit. Lisa McGifford, Lisa. I have a general uh, comment about the uh, enforcement, enforcement issues, and hopefully it'll fit in here. Uh, I'm Lisa McGifford. I'm with Consumers Union Safe Patient Project, and it's good to be here with you in California today. Um, as you will recall, the, the staff recommended during the sunset review process that um, you accept a proposal for physicians who are on probation to notify and inform their patients when they're on probation. And this board did not uh, agree to that recommendation, but we felt it was a very good and strong recommendation. We have uh, discovered that in your regulations, everyone gets informed except the patient. The hospital where the doctor works, any facility where the doctor works, uh, any uh, chief of staff of places where they work, uh, but the patients are left in the dark. And we find that patients typically, or public doesn't typically know who the medical board is or whether to check the medical board, and they might not even think about checking the status of their doctor if it's someone that they've seen regularly uh, for a while and that person has come under some kind of disciplinary order they wouldn't think to check. So um, what we are recommending is for you to amend your guidelines um, to make it a standard of uh, condition of probation that physicians who continue to be allowed to see patients be required to inform them in some way. Uh, we're open to working with you on thinking of all the different ways that that might happen, but we think it needs to happen in a direct communication between the doctor and the patient, maybe in the office or face-to-face -face or, you know, there are various different ways to do that. Uh, and so we ask that you put this on your agenda at the next meeting, and I'll raise that again at the end of this meeting to when you talk about next meeting's agendas. Uh, but we respectfully ask for you to reconsider this issue. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Any other comments on the Enforcement Committee report? I don't know. Okay. And then we're going to um, yeah. proceed to agenda item. 13, um, Enforcement Chief's Report, Ms. Threadgill. Good afternoon. May I have a motion to approve 14 orders following completion of probation and three orders for license surrender during probation or administrative action? So moved. Second. Second. Oh. I may ref uh, ask you to refer to agenda item 13B with attachments. The executive summary notes observations made regarding the statistics. Are there any questions? Having none. Questions from board members. Uh, on. On October 3rd, I attended Dr. Yip's Grand Rounds presentation at UCLA Harbor facility. The presentation was well received, and if any one of the members would like a copy of the PowerPoint or would like assistance with a presentation on 
that topic or any other topic um, uh, in other venues, please let me know and I'll be happy to try to accommodate you. In July, I form, informed you that DCA was in the process of auditing our evidence accounts. The department has now concluded the audit and provided us with an opportunity to respond to a draft report. We will respond by the end of the month and the final report will be provided to the members. We are currently in the process of advertising to fill non-sworn uh, investigator positions in the complaint unit. These positions, you may recall, were received as a part of the CPI. This um, new uh, non-sworn unit is designed to relieve sworn investigations, uh, sworn investigators from caseloads, um, from high caseloads. Um, it's anticipated that um, this unit uh, will, it will result in lower, fewer cases being sent to the sworn investigators for investigation, thus um, lowering field investigators' caseload. And historically, we have found that the lower caseloads result in a reduced in reduced case timeline. So that's one thing that we had planned and had been planned before 304 in order to assist in bringing the case aging time frame down. So we're finally able to start with this process and we will um, hopefully get it in place before the transition uh, so that we can further assist uh, the investigators once they are over at HQIU in um, uh, improving the time frames. That's my report, unless there are other, oh, one important thing that I forgot to do. Um, I would like to acknowledge and thank the investigators who are here, who have been here this week for your security. And currently we have um, investigators in the back and I'd like you to stand up. And I'd like to thank you. Um, Kathleen, uh, Kathleen Nichols is the area su supervising investigator too, and she is housed in our San Bernardino district office. And uh, she, her, she has staff here. I believe I saw Natalie Zelmer, um, Amy Pitchkiss, and El Veronica Elva. So having said that, this concludes my report. Um, we need to vote on the motion. Oh, you didn't vote? No, we, we, no. we didn't. You just you have to keep up cut with us me. off. <laughs> all, all, <laughs> Stop, I'm sorry. All in favor of uh, the motion to um, regarding the license to say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any questions for Ms. Threadgill? I agree. Before you return to your seat, I do want to um, read out, even though you didn't on your executive summary, um, the, the comparison of the 2012-13 versus 11-12 statistics. Um, average number of days from complaint received by the board to complaint closed or sent to inv investigation decreased by 23 days. Average days from receipt of complaint to investigation to case closed or referred for action decreased by 106 days. And the number of suspension orders increased from 74 to 78. So thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Any questions from, member of the, from members of the public on Enforcement Chief's report? Yes. Yes, yes, Jeffrey. Oh. I, I also want to publicly thank uh, Ms. Gleth, who took me to the uh, district office. I think uh, it was a very good experience, not a lot. I encourage anyone to have time to do that. And I hope in the future, when we merge, you're probably not part of the medical board, but I think we continue to work at your district office. I, I'm sorry, I forgot to add that following the presentation at Grand Rounds, Dr. Yip um, uh, went, uh, went to the Cerritos office along with me and met staff and had an opportunity to, to speak with them for um, a few minutes and 
an hour <laughs> a few minutes. over lunch, and uh, it was minutes. really, the staff really appreciated that, Dr. Yip. Thank you. We're going to make this part of every board member's orientation, a visit to a district office. So I, before you leave, I also wanted to um, thank Dr. Levine for calling out those numbers. The public perception is not always what is reality. And I think that we have to do a better job about informing the public that we're doing better at what's important. So I want to thank you as well. But I think that we have to take some personal responsibility over here to make sure that this information is also released so people know. Thank you, Ms. Yaroslavsky. Okay, we're going to move on to, Did, oops. We need to check for members I of the did, public. I did, I have. So check again. But then doc, Dr. Yip spoke before Sorry. we could really assess. It, are, there, are there comments from members of the public about the enforcement, related to the enforcement chief's report? Okay, to move on? Okay. okay. Um, moving on now to agenda item 14, vertical enforcement program, Ms. Castro. And I hope this change doesn't mean we won't get to see you ever again. No, you'll get to see us more. And, I, and I'm all for tooting your own horn. I think that this board tends to be very modest, um, and you shouldn't be, because I think on a daily basis, uh, this board undertakes a very, very important function, uh, and that is to protect consumers uh, from dangerous doctors and to elevate the practice uh, wherever it can of the physicians who are doing it the right way. So. Um, it's always an honor and a privilege to get to um, address you. For the benefit of the newer board members, my name is Gloria Castro. I'm the senior assistant of the health quality enforcement section. We reside in the attorney general's office, and we are charged legislatively to investigate and prosecute disciplinary actions of your licensees. And we do that proudly every day throughout the state. We have five offices located in San Diego, Los Angeles, Fresno, Sacramento, and Fresno. Did I say San Francisco? No. Well, we have, yeah, San Francisco. There we go. We have 55 committed public interest attorneys that on a daily basis represent you before the Office of Administrative Hearings and from time to time on quarterly meetings such as this morning um, to hear their passionate arguments for you to do the right thing or to encourage you to do something that is the opposite of what somebody else did, which is to lead you to the right path. Um, on staffing, uh, we just hired a new uh, supervising deputy attorney general in Los Angeles. Her name is Judith Alvarado, and she filled my vacancy um, that I made when I became the senior assistant. I hope to fill a position for uh, SDAG, Supervising Deputy Attorney General in Sacramento very soon, and we continue to fill vacancies statewide. Um, we were uh, subject to some furloughs, but we also have been subject to retirement, but we've been able to happily attract very, very uh, qualified and experienced candidates from different prosecutorial offices. On a yearly basis, we manage about 1,500 of your investigations out of 12 district offices in which we have placed lead prosecutors. And these are the most uh, experienced deputy attorney generals in our office that interface with the medical board investigators um, several times a week, uh, if not more, uh, to go ahead and manage 1,500, 1500 to 1,700 investigations that you, you know, manage on a yearly basis. About 300 of those become accusations, and those are managed by the rest of the office, the 45 other attorneys. Now, uh, we were already uh, always striving to come up with best practices and to identify areas where improvements could be made to the vertical enforcement program. As such, I meet with uh, Kimberly Kirkmeyer every other week, and we discuss issues and on an ad hoc basis. We have a completely open line of communication with Ms. Kirkmeyer, and it's something that my SDAGs also enjoy. And she knows she can call anybody anytime, and we will respond quickly. The same level of uh, interaction also exists with uh, the Chief of Enforcement, Renee Threadgill, and the Deputy Director, um, I'm sorry, the Deputy <coughs> Chief of Enforcement, Laura Sweet. And we often discuss uh, cases in dispute, cases on um, different issues, and uh, we're always uh, available to each other. Our next quarterly meeting um, between MBC and HQE management staff is on November 7th. And um, given the fact that I've been on the job for six months, I have strived to make sure to meet with every single um, 
office that has interface with our office at the Attorney General's office. So as such, with the assistance of DCA, uh, Ms. Johnson and Ms. Lopez, um, who facilitated a meeting with OAH. So I met with um, Linda Kabatic and uh, Judge Alvord, who you've heard from earlier today. And my main focus uh, on, at that October 2nd, 2013 meeting was to find efficiencies where DAGs can help OAH um, in moving our cases quicker. As you heard, uh, our renewed focus and vigor in filing interim suspension orders has had an effect on their staff and they've responded so uh, and graciously they've responded uh, by hearing our cases however wherever efficiencies can be made in the process by our DAGs I am willing to make sure that that occurs uh, and so I feel, believe it's a very important um, that if this board can support their BCP for more judges uh, I would encourage you to um, our lead prosecutors meet once a month um, to discuss issues and our SDAGs every other week. And this is in response to your request that we have more uniformity between cities and how uh, VE is administered. We continue to reconcile uh, unpled uh, pleading lists. I provide them on a monthly basis to Ms. Kirkmeyer and then working with her staff on what they believe is on our office, we reconcile both lists to make sure that nothing falls um, out of, out of our purview. We provide statistics uh, as needed and requested on an ad hoc basis, and uh, we bend over backwards to provide as much information as possible and to respond quickly to your legal needs. Uh, I'm happy to report that we went ahead and took conviction cases uh, off of being assigned to DAGs, and we leave them now with the lead prosecutors. What, why is this important? Well, simple conviction cases that do not involve quality of care can result in some efficiencies in the process and lower costs to you in the investigation. And the way I see it is that's a DAG that now I can assign to that ISO, to that quality of care case. So um, our subpoena enforcement cases continue to be litigated in Superior Court. I'm, un I'm unhappy to report that we have not prevailed on some of those. However, uh, with your investigative staff and our legal staff, we are continuing to try to refine the process to be able to get medical records. It's shocking when doctors don't want to give us medical records because when they don't, we cannot do our work. And that puts a stop um, on everything. So uh, we continue to work hard to make sure that we get the evidence we need. Uh, we will be participating in a medical consultant subject interview training. We've assigned um, Estag Alvarado to that. Estag Bell, who you, I think, heard from this morning, at least half of the panel did, um, he's going to be continuing to participate in the expert reviewer training that's going to happen in San Diego to offer the perspective of what the DAG is looking for from an expert at a hearing. And so as you can see, we, we are intimately involved in trying to make sure that you know, our quality of and excellence is always elevated. Uh, we sent a DAG to the task force meeting on prescribing practices and um, we will make him available. He's one of our uh, DAG, Edward Kim. Uh, he's very, very knowledgeable in pain management cases. And uh, we have fully staffed um, the DAG position at headquarters and the licensing um, sections of the medical board. And uh, this is helping us make sure that we are available to you uh, and to be able to opine on processes such as cease practice orders. This is one of the things that we've been working on where we want to find efficiencies where it's a very simple case, someone didn't go to PACE. You either did it or you didn't. And to find efficiencies so that we can quickly and efficiently try to get them to cease practice until they go to PACE or pay their bill or do whatever it is that is um, fairly simple to look at but hadn't been done in a mo more efficient manner. And um, just real quickly, um, I'll move on to the presentation which is a uh, number four of the enforcement committee and just following up on the comments that Ms. Kirkmeyer and um, the DCA uh, folks made. Um, health quality enforcement section is very excited to uh, partner up with the Department of Consumer Affairs and uh, we will do everything possible to make sure that it's a very uh, seamless process. We are, we will endeavor to do everything that we need to do to be as helpful as possible. 
I believe that um, it's very it's very obvious um, to a lot of us, but maybe the newer board members need to hear this, and that is that the vertical enforcement uh, model has been institutionalized, so that is here to stay. Now, I think this is crucial because it will allow stakeholders to, we can meet with the stakeholders, hear their concerns, and, you know, because not everyone's going to agree with what it is, the, the direction the task force is going in at the moment. I want to emphasize at the moment. Um, once we get that public comment, you know, we can, the task force can certainly, and, you know, it may very well change its position. Um, but, you know, these are our initial thoughts. Um, I, too, shared the concern about, and I have from the beginning of the discussion around these outpatient surgery centers, the number of required inspections. I, I just don't find it satisfactory. And whether it's an enhancement of an existing regulation or a new law, um, whatever it is we need to do, we, we ought to do it. And self-inspections, you know, there just there ought to be something more here. And uh, that's what Dev touched on, and I wanted to touch on it as well. Um, there are some accrediting uh, agencies that I, I think they do have good internal standards and that ought, they, ought, they, they could serve as a, um, a, 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 a model for others to follow because the inconsistency amongst the uh, four or five accrediting agencies is a little concerning to me personally. So I want to further get, get that sort of commentary from the public as the task force continues. Uh, I have one major issue and then we'll uh, come to the recommended actions. Uh, the task force members also reviewed the issue of requiring all physicians who perform procedures in outpatient surgery settings to be certified by an ABMS affiliated board in the specialty of the procedures performing at the OSS. Currently, many physicians who are well trained and qualified to perform these procedures in OSS are not ABMS certified or even in a hospital, in rural hospitals. The MBC does not license physicians by specialty or require ABMS certification to become licensed. And this is the most important I want, especially the public, to hear from us why we went this route. The proposed new peer review requirement, and this is very important, even for a solo doc practicing in an OSS, the proposed new peer review requirement for all physicians to be subject to peer review on a regular basis would address the concerns that the physicians who only practice in OSS do not have training that is necessary to safely perform procedures in outpatient surgery settings. I would like to ask any questions uh, before we go to the recommendations. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Um, I want to thank you for your report, both of you, and for your um, attention to this, um, this issue. Uh, I heard that you um, feel that doctors don't need to have uh, privileges at hospitals, and I wonder how you're going to address the need for doctors to be able to transfer patients from a surgery center to a, a hospital if, in fact, they don't have transfer privileges and therefore only can use 911 uh, a public transfer, that's one question. So answer that one and we'll go to the next question. Uh, yeah, Mr. Yaroslavsky, the, the, the way it is answered is that to be accredited, they have to have an agreement, a transfer agreement with a hospital and a, a physician who can take care of that person when that patient is transferred. That is in the regulations already. So that means that a, a, a patient, there will be no lapse of uh, time for a patient to go to a hospital for acute care, regardless of the status of the doctor having privileges. Is that what you're saying? Because that, yes. That may, not, that may be the rule, but that's not what's that's always correct. been the practice. Actually, if a physician is absent or, or has a patient and then a physician are not in town, so the other physicians in that hospital will take care of him. So the, what this does is, without the transfer agreement, they cannot be accredited by, by our accrediting agencies, both with a hospital and with a physician who can handle that emergency. Okay, um, the second question I had was regarding um, ABMS specialty and not having that necessary. Uh, 
there was the intention, I thought, that doctors that were going to perform procedures in surgery centers, uh, the ability to perform them in surgery centers had to also be the qualifications of being able to do that they would apply the same as if they could do it in an acute care hospital. And the object being to circumvent the hospital where you've got uh, over, you've got peer people standing around to help in case of an emergency, that was deleted by not having to have any kind of, um, I understand you, you don't, we don't license by specialty, but how is that going to be addressed for the doctor that's performing in a surgery center uh, procedures that they have not, they would not normally be able to do in a uh, acute care hospital? Uh, there are two different areas where that, that comes into play, where which becomes difficult to implement if we take that role. One is the rural areas. Actually, inpatient procedures in many rural hospitals, ABMS certification is not required. It's the training, experience, and peer review. Those three are the required entities. So not just the outpatient. Inpatient procedures in many hospitals, not in um, uh, urban Los Angeles or urban San Francisco or Sacramento, but many rural areas, that's not a requirement. Joint Commission does not require you to have board certification to perform procedures. It is the hospital medical staff which decides whether to or not to implement board certification or not. That's one. Number two is many physicians, I'll give you an example. Two of my best plastic surgeons in my group left because their cosmetic practice significantly improved. So there is no reason for them to have hospital privileges because they are covered when they need, they have an agreement with the hospital and also they have an agreement with other plastic surgeons. So it's a burden on them to have a hospital privilege just to have it. If they, if they have it, it's great, but it doesn't, when they don't have it doesn't mean that they can do that procedure. Okay, so in the reverse, the, the person that's well trained in plastic surgery has coverage, but the person that's trained in another specialty, for example, OBGYN, who now finds that it's financially feasible for them to be doing plastic work, it, it, go from the other, I, I just looking for the protection uh, of the enforcement issue of, of the problems that we have seen, so the, I'm the, trying. Yeah. I'm not going to fix everything yeah, else. So I that's apologize. a credentialing issue, really not a board certification issue. Right. And that, that is stipulated in the, in the accreditation process. So okay. there are two, two issues you're, you're talking about. One is credentialing, and the other is peer review. And we have enough regulations on those two to prevent someone to go beyond what they're capable of doing. Okay. May I? Go back to the hospital privilege issue. I just want to clarify what's actually in the law with what's required for being accredited. And that's uh, that with the transfer agreements, there, there's three possibilities currently, and that's to have a written transfer agreement uh, with a, a local hospital, to permit surgery only by a licensee, who has admitting privileges at the local hospital, and I'm paraphrasing, but these are the key points. And then the third option is the one that's being proposed by the task force to eliminate, and that's uh, for an OSS to submit approval, uh, a detailed procedural plan for handling medical emergencies and the accrediting agency has to review that plan and it says no reasonable plan shall be disapproved by the accrediting agency. That's the one that the task force is proposing to eliminate. We, what uh, Mr. Warden can uh, help us too, but uh, what we are actually, we thought there was weakness. Actually, that was a weak law. There was a way out. Someone can pick one of the three not all, and one of them was very weak, so we were going, to, we were allowing, by, by current statute, we are allowing a loophole where the consumer protection might be a serious issue, so that's why we, our recommendations will be some statute changes to, to, for this, to make it stronger for the consumer protection. That was a thank you. Is that clear? Dr. Lewis. 
Yes, I... Dr. Yip, sorry. I am confused. I, I do better visually than I do um, verbally. But um, I do share your concern about um, not being board certified. Um, when some of us are faced with hiring people, we, we have requirements for that job. One is a bachelor's degree, or we can have so many years of experience and associate degree. So I think there may be alternatives to allow very experienced uh, providers to do procedures, but I think there has to be some kind of insurance on the public and on the medical board that these providers can do that, that function, not just one year of an internship and all of a sudden you're like doing blepharoplasties or something, I mean, that kind of thing. So I think there could be in lieu of maybe a balance uh, rather than get it. And um, regarding your uh, question about um, transferring if there's emergencies, it is regulation now the, because there used to be dumping. I so know, there are interfacility inter -facility agreements that have to be in place and that would probably be part of a, an SOP at that facility, that outpatient, to be able to, if the physician wasn't there, to be able to do that. So we'd have to be comfortable with that was in place and review their SOPs for those emergencies. Not we, but the agency. Just to answer, Dr. Lewis, uh, to answer your question, uh, each of our regulating agencies we accredit have information on privileging what they can do, what they can do. So that privileging is, comes from the training and experience. That's where even every hospital has. Only in the urban areas where the hospitals insist on board certification. It's not, if you do that, Joshua Tree Hospital probably might not have any surgeons. So, so the, the, that's why where we are looking at strengthening is in that privileging and peer review. And those two are the important ones because this will make it stronger rather than weaker. That's the way we felt when we discussed. 20 years from now, this will not be an issue. Um, some, of, some of the board certifications are not that old. And so there are people who have been practicing in the specialty who are very competent, who actually never had the opportunity to take and pass boards in, sorry, in the specialty. 20 years from now, it will not be an issue. I mean, I think um, and we're going to see um, as my compatriots um, begin to retire from clinical practice and those, you know, we're going to see essentially board certification will be standard. But we're in a transition period and, and there, are ma there are many physicians practicing who never had the chance to get board certified. Dr. Yip, do you have a? Yeah, the, um, I'm clear that the service center need to have a transfer agreement with the hospital. I'm not sure that there's actually required documentation that the staff, the surgeon, a member of the OSS actually need to have a documented evidence that he or she had an accepting physician if he, if he or she does not have admitting privilege in the hospital. Well, I'm saying, let's say a plastic surgeon who only operate in OSS, no admitting privilege in any hospital. I'm not sure our four equity agents will actually ask them, Dr. So-and-so, who is your covering physician if the patient did be transferred to the hospital. I don't think there was I don't think that's currently required it. And that's her issue. If what happened in this case happened. See, I, I think we all have to remember one thing, and the, where I'm coming from is I've either seen a case or we've decided on a case, number one. And number two is, is that we don't make rules and regulations for the majority, because the majority, everybody is taking care of business. I understand that. It's for the minority. We need to be able to protect and ensure, and I'm not talking about Joshua Tree. I'm talking about Los Angeles that I have familiarity. So if you're going to tell me that it's going to be okay, I'm going to take your word for it because you've looked into it and you know this to be true. But I'm only raising it because my concern is I have seen situations where that, so if the laws have changed since I've started paying attention, that's good. We, we thoroughly discussed. We, we, we totally understand. And also on one more thing on board certification, one of the licensing agent, uh, accrediting agencies still had something called board eligible. That word doesn't even exist anymore. Right, Either you're board qualified or board certified. 
board qualified is only for a certain number of years after you finish training. If you don't take the board exam, then you are not neither board qualified nor board certified, even though you do have full training. So that there are, there are multiple issues and just board al alone and that word board certified, board eligible, board qualified. Yeah, Barbara, that, this, this topic, the topic of in number of inspections and that, this was probably 80% of our discussion. Okay. It was a healthy, robust discussion. I suspect it will be as well when we go into the interested parties phase as well. Uh, and as we proceed, and again, these, these regular, you know, what we, our final report, because the task force will end, is um, it may look different. Uh, but these are our, our, our right. initial thoughts, if you will. Thank you for that. So you had some recommendations. Yeah, if there are no questions, I think I'll go to recommendation one. <coughs> recommendation one is authorize staff to hold an interested parties meeting regarding proposed changes to the statute and regulations impacting accredited outpatient surgery settings. Thanks. And we would like a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Public comment or nothing? Yeah. What? Is there any public comment? Public comment yeah. on the first. First motion. Uh, yeah. Do you want to move these as a group or is? No, separate? I want to move each one separately. Okay. Then public comment on the first um, recommendation, holding an interested parties meeting. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Dr. Kananadev. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, uh, motion number two, after in the interested parties meeting, authorize the outpatient surgery task force members to direct staff to draft proposed language to amend current health and safety code statutes regarding OSS to improve consumer protection. So moved. Second. Uh, move public comment. Yeah, okay. And if there's not any public comment on the general, yeah. what we've done so far, that's fine as well. I mean, it doesn't have to be each, to each specific motion, but if there's no public comment, you know, great. So let's, let's vote on, since we've got a, a motion and a second on this, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And the third? The last one, I'll assure you. After the interest, interested parties meeting, authorize the OSS task force members to direct the staff to draft proposed language to amend existing regulation and or draft new regulations within the California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Division 13, to further clarify existing and or new statutes pertaining to outpatient surgery centers. Okay, can I have a motion? I'll move that. Second. Any public comment on this? So I, so I want to ask a question on this one. Go ahead. So, uh, so on this one specifically, um, will there be the opportunity at that point to at least put a bar at the level of those accreditation agencies of what the minimum standards would be? That would be the result. Mr. Warden. What? Well, right now, all accreditation agencies have minimum standards they have to meet. I'm talking about overall. Right. That's current right now what we're talking about is enhancing that to uh, a even more more consumer protection oriented uh, level so it's one of the changes that dr gond have talked about was removing the easiest way of becoming accredited that's a huge uh, consumer protection uh, issue in my opinion that is something that needs to be done um, I'm once we have the interested parties in meeting, I think we'll hear even some other ideas that maybe we have not heard. And so that we can incorporate all of the, the stuff that we have and that will be um, coming back to the board for um, review and approval at, at, at some point. Uh, the regulation process, we have some regs we know have to be changed and we, we might have some regs that we need to add and that's another part of the thing that we'll be discussing in the interested party, but it's all designed to um, enhance consumer protection for the consumers in the outpatient surgery. Right. I wasn't suggesting that we should weaken the rules. What I was asking was is that as a part of this whole process, 
interested parties meeting and then the intended legislation drafts that within that whole package would be at least what the bar is across the board. So it didn't matter which accreditation agency was doing the accreditation, at least they would have to meet minimum standards. Yes. Uh, the, yes. the, the, the question is yes. That's, thank you. That's, it's yes, okay, it's yes you. and they do, do that now, but, but not to the level that we want. Well, it, uh, no, they, uh, let, me, let me answer from the task force perspective, or the, the member's perspective, my perspective, and that is, as Kirk said, the answer is yes. We seek to change, I seek to elevate Raise those standards Thank you. because I find them to be, this is my own view, insufficient. So I want to see an elevation of those standards across the board applicable to all the accredited. Because that's really our authority, that's what right? I, that's where exactly where I was going. I don't want to see accreditation A, B, and C, and D have that's different. I want to see they can have different, but at least they have to meet what we are requiring. Yes. Thank you very that much. Is our, that, is our, and, that is our charge. And now I'm just, now I'm going to open public comment on the discussion because rather than just limit it to the three recommendations um, Lisa McGifford and then uh, anyone else who has um, comments they'd like to share with the board and the members of the task force hi thank you my name is Lisa McGifford and for the new members I didn't really introduce our work I'm with Consumers Union we are the policy and advocacy arm of consumer reports and I direct a national uh, initiative called the Safe Patient Project. We work all over the country, and we have a project specifically here in Cal California monitoring and working with the board. So on this subject, uh, we look forward to working with you and being uh, participating in, to, in these meetings. Um, a couple of things we would like to put in the mix. Um, one is that we really would like to see the full history of the uh, clinics uh, online for people to look at, and we understand that there is not uh, legal authority to do that, and uh, that some of the clinics do provide that information, and some of them don't. So, what we're, you know, what we're asking is for um, there to be uh, some strong encouragement, some guidance uh, to include this kind of information uh, on, on the website. We also would like to see, in general, the website to be the place where information is collected about the clinics, like adverse events relating to the clinics, and, um, and even some links to disciplinary actions to the doctors, if that is present. Um, with regard to the conversation you just had, uh, we strongly uh, believe that these um, uh, people who are operating these clinics need to be board certified. Uh, and we see that as, from the consumer perspective, that's an assurance that they meet a certain level of competency because these clinics are pretty much operating uh, out there on their own. There is some oversight from the crediting agencies, and I'm glad to see there's an interest in increasing the oversight, but uh, that would give people the assurance that they are um, uh, ha are competent in what they're what they're doing. Peer review is good, but it's not something that's transparent to the public, uh, and so it's not something that the public can benefit fr from. We also uh, support the hospital um, uh, privileges, and uh, we think that would ensure some continuity of care. There are things that we think the um, these clinics should have to report. Or, to the medical board and the accreditors, deaths occurring within 30 days, transfers to hospitals, and significant events like adverse events. And finally, we'd like to see some, uh, some discussion, and we had a really good conversation with Kim uh, uh, about this, that um, there be a, a support from the board to change the law to require these clinics to submit information to OSHPUD, which is the organization, the agency in California that collects data, so that the volume information and the types of procedures in these clinics is being collected, and we're happy to work with you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You just hit that red button right <laughs> on, the, on the nose. That is very impressive. Is there anyone else in the, uh, among members of the public who'd like to make comments? If not, Dr. Gananadev, you get yeah, the final word. Madam Chair, I, uh, we do take uh, the public comment seriously, as the entire board does. Uh, we did not comment on a lot of other issues we discussed. One of them is be transparent. We want to make sure that all the information about those outpatient surgery centers will be on the website. 
amazingly, we probably will be the only ones who will be doing that because the two other agencies, that is CMS certified, doesn't have any, not much, and CDPH doesn't have much, so we are going beyond what everyone else is doing, and we want to make sure that it's very transparent. Okay, Dr. Bishop. I just want to comment that, that although um, I really agree with safety in these clinics, I've worked in one before and I think it's very important, I think a, a misconception is that someone who is board certified gives you a better guarantee of, of safety, and I think all of the board members will agree that most of the physicians we discipline are board certified. So that alone does not give you any additional measure of, of certainty. I believe there's a number of good physicians out there who are not, for whatever reason, who do good practice. And I think that the key here is, as Dr. Gananadev said, to make sure the credentialing agencies toe the line with what we expect to make sure these physicians can be credentialed to the highest standards of what they do in terms of their, their training and their skills. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bishop. Um, I'm going to make one editorial comment, which is, Please. which is I think that the move from board certification to maintenance of certification will in the future actually provide a much better guarantee of continued competence and professionalism. And the traditional board certification of an exam every 10 years is a symbol, but not necessarily a guarantee. Yes, Dr. Lewis. But we have yet to learn if continued uh, maintain maintenance of your certification translates into a more competent physician. Currently, there's no data on right. that yet. I said it was an editorial comment. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I'm making an editorial observation, but which I've actually researched. I can't find it. I, okay. Um, we're going to move on now. We have one more agenda item. We're going to, uh, as I said at the beginning of the board meeting, we'll handle agenda item 18 tomorrow um, at Ms. Yaroslavsky's request. And we're going to move on now to Dr. Bishop. Um, and the um, consideration of regulatory proposal to revise the PA physician assistant scope of practice. And, oh, Mr. Sachs, I'm sorry. Right, it's, it's the two of us, and, and I'd like to introduce this time Mr. Bob Sachs, who's the president of the PA board, who's kindly uh, come in to help me out with this today. Uh, first of all, just let me say that I want to really thank uh, Messrs. Sachs. Uh, Glenn Mitchell and all the other PA board members and staff for their warm welcome and help during that first meeting where I was just slightly overwhelmed by a whole new environment. So please, thank you very much, Mr. Sack, for that. Um, so I've uh, actually, some the staff here has actually provided me with some speaking points. So if I may, Mr. Sachs, I'll start off and please. and please interrupt me and correct me as needed. I very much appreciate it. Um, shall we start with agenda item 19 or go right to 20? They, they kind of flow from one to the other. What would your preference be, Madam Chair? Um, just go. Just go. Okay, well, very good. <laughs> We've been doing together. All right, very briefly, um, the activities of the Physician uh, Assistant Board most recently um, was to look at the uh, ma Manual of Disciplinary Guidelines, which was updated most recently in 2007. The board staff identified changes needed to update the guidelines. Additionally, the uniform standards regarding substance abusing healing arts licensees, uh, SB 1441, are to be incorporated in the guidelines. At the August 2013 meeting, the board approved and proposed regulatory language and directed board staff to proceed with the rulemaking process. The board's strategic plan was last updated in November 2009. The Department of Consumer Affairs has encouraged boards that have not updated their plans recently to review and update their plans. Board members and staff will be working with the Department of Consumer Affairs Solid Training Office to review and update the plan. Currently, Solid staff are conducting a stakeholder survey and will interview board members to assist in identifying board strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and future trends impacting the physician assistant profession. The board recently updated their What is a PA Consumer Information Brochure? A regulatory proposal to implement Assembly Bill 2699 Healthcare Events Requirements for Exemption as Required by Business and Professions Code Section 901 was approved by the Office of Administrative Law in August 2013 and became effective October 1, 2013. 
As you've heard from the medical board staff, the DCA has rolled out the new Breeze system for healthcare boards. The PA board has converted all licensing and enforcement records to Breeze and began using the system on October 8, 2013. So moving on to agenda item 20, unless there is any uh, comment on, on that. Comment from members of the public. I have one comment for agenda item 20, none for 19. All right, very good. Um, first of all, please uh, refer to any agenda item. Any questions from oh, I'm sorry. members? I'm any sorry. questions from board members? You turn me on and you wind me up and just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> the energizer <laughs> bunny, go. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Let's, let's move on to agenda item 20 in your packet. And this agenda item uh, contains the proposed language uh, to uh, amend Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations, Section 1399.541, regarding the personal presence of the physician while a physician assistant acts as a first or second assistant in surgery. Um, in 2011, concerns were raised that the existing regulation did not reflect current medical community standards. Under the existing regulation, the PA may act as first or second assistant in surgery under the supervision of a supervising physician. To reflect the current community standards, this proposal would clarify that a PA may so act without the personal presence of the supervising physician if the supervising physician is immediately available to the PA. Immediately available would def be defined as able to return to the patient without delay upon the request of the PA or to address any situation requiring the supervising physician's service. In July 2013, PA board staff shared revised draft language with medical board staff and legal counsel to anticipate any concerns the MBC board members may have. None were identified. At the August 2013 PA board meeting, board members voted to approve the proposed language and submit the proposal to the whole medical board. It should be noted that the proposed language is similar to and modeled after a recent medical board regulatory proposal regarding physician avail availability for mid-level practitioners, including physician's assistants, to perform elective cosmetic procedures, 16 CCR section 1364.50, that was approved by the medical board earlier this year. The term immediately available will be standardized, familiar, and understood by supervising physicians and physician assistants. This will eliminate physician and physician assistant confusion as to the definition of immediately available. Please note that, uh, that one or more non-substantive change need to be made to the text. This is not shown in the language in your agenda packet, but please refer to page BRD 20-3. Look at the second to the last paragraph, I subsection 1. Please look at the second to the last line of the paragraph all the way at the end. The proposal also should strike the word approved as a modifier to the supervising physician. This change is made to reflect a 2002 change to the law permitting any licensed physician and surgeon to act as a supervising physician for a PA. So this change would only conform to existing law. Consumer protection is assured because the term immediately available is precisely defined and will ensure that the physician assistant is appropriately supervised. Additionally, amending the regulation will not reduce consumer protection because the supervising physician will be immediately available to provide assistance to the physician assistant. Ultimately, the supervising physician is responsible for the care that is provided by the physician assistants. And now if I may uh, refer you to Mr. Sachs, who's the president of the PA board, as I mentioned. Um, but I would like to make a motion on behalf of the PA board that the medical board consider this regulatory proposal and direct staff to begin rulemaking process to adopt the proposed language. Do I have a second? Um, Mr. Then Mr. Sachs, and then we'll ask Mr. for Mr. Sachs, did you have anything additional to add to my? <laughs> uh, no, thank you, Dr. Bishop. Uh, thank you for having him be on our board. As you can see, he's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Get the wall We <laughs> did what you asked us to do last year in coming back and looking at the language and discussing it with medical board attorneys and Ms. Kirchmeyer, and what you have before you today is the new language which we think is very workable, still protects the consumer. Obviously this all uh, requires the supervising physician to delegate the procedures that the physician assistant is going to be performing. A PA just can't go out and start doing surgery or closing the surgery unless he's had specific training and the supervising physician has delegated that authority. Great. Dr. Krauss. 
My personal experience with PAs and surgery has been excellent, uh, but I have some questions regarding current law or proposed changes to law. Um, in the cases where I've worked with PAs, uh, and the PA has been performing a part of the surgery really in essence as a primary surgeon, it's been an opening procedure or a closing procedure or a dressing. So one question is, is there a body of law which dictates how much of the procedure the PA may do, especially in a circumstance where the physician may not be immediately in the room, is I wonder if we might be inviting a circumstance for two or three contiguous ORs to each have a PA in them with an immediate single uh, supervising surgeon. Uh, and my second question is, in considering this, we just came off of a discussion where we're concerned about whether or not a surgeon in an outpatient surgery center is board certified, while at the same time we're considering a discussion where we're allowing PAs to do more and more as potential primary surgeons. So I just want us to be consistent in standards that we set for medical care. Just, I think I'll defer to your attorney, Ms. Webb, regarding the first part of the question. It, point of clarification, I thought the language was first assistant. Second. Uh, it is first assistant. First or uh, second assistant. First to second assistant, but uh, in my particular practice, I'm a physician assistant in cardiac surgery. What this would allow me to do is after the appropriate timeout had taken place with the physician in the room, he could go do his medical records or something in the staff lounge in the operating room complex, and I could start harvesting the saphenous vein, which is what I do, whether he's there or not. Uh, so the whole idea of it is that, yes, there could be the potential that uh, Dr. Krauss brought up. Uh, the orthopedic surgeon could be uh, starting a case in the next room while the PA was closing an E or something similar to that. As far as the PA doing the majority of an operation, no, that's not going to happen because for one thing, we all have to have privileges from the hospitals that we practice in. And again, the physician uh, has to delegate the authority and ultimately the physician is responsible for what the PA performs. Dr. Gennady uh, The procedures uh, Mr. Sachs mentioned, uh, at least in the, in the major operating room, we consider that as a first assistant rather than doing a procedure because you are part of a cardiac team and you are harvesting the vein, which is basically a procedure, but under the supervision of a surgeon who is the primary surgeon, who is doing the main procedure there. It is part of our, my burn team. Uh, we have one of the busiest burn centers in the state of California. All team members are doing multiple things because you do want that patient out of the operating room as fast as possible with the lowest blood loss. So I don't consider that as a primary surgeon. It is part of, it's an assisting a primary surgeon as a part of the procedures as part of the team rather than separately doing somewhere else. Dr. Lewis. I, um, I understand the concern of the Physician Assistance Board to allow their, um, their practitioners to be more and more responsible and participatory and with the uh, primary surgeon or primary physician. I just feel a little uncomfortable in opening this up and going down the slippery slope because I see that, okay, today we allow first assist and certain procedures, what happens tomorrow, tomorrow down the road? And we've seen this with some of the um, Senate bills that have been introduced not too long ago, the Hernandez bills, and we've, we've had many discussions about that, um, pro and con. I just need more assurance, and I think it's a public safety issue, more assurance that tomorrow you won't be coming back and we go the next step. And all of a sudden, physician assistant. Can I interrupt assistance. for just a second? Because this is existing law where we're adding the underlined 
uh, portion that identifies what is immediately available. So, so it's. Do this. You're right. You're absolutely right. You're right. So, what this is is all this is is adding. Oh. The definition of immediately available to clarify. So it. I'm I'm talking way beyond what we're. Hmm. Uh, we're not, yeah, we're not revisiting the original oh. decision. As a point of procedure, Madam Chair, uh, I would say with all due respect, the way to seconds should come from the chair and not from staff. I'm sorry? When a member is speaking, as is, as is his or her privilege and right, any sort of interruptions come from their, one of their colleagues or the, <laughs> or the chair in the middle of a statement. I just, I'd, I'd hate to see it interrupted that way. That's just an observation. Uh, Dr. Lewis, I meant no disrespect. Oh, no, no. I wanted to. I, I, I'm just, I was feeling more passionate about this than maybe I was going, <laughs> I was going on and on and so I will, uh, but, but I just, I have to raise this point and I have to raise this point in this group um, for something later on for us to remember. It may not be germane today, but it may be germane at some other point. <clears throat> If, if I could address that, one thing is uh, physician assistants are dependent practitioners. We can only practice in the state of California yeah. with supervising physicians. We are very proud of that team concept and have no intention of ever saying physician assistants are going to practice independently. And, and there's no, no um, diminution of the role of physician assistants. I've worked with them for... 30 some years and they're my, some of my closest colleagues and nurse practitioners also. I just put this thought out there. It's just uh, sitting back here in my mind about later on, just, just to make it out there to you. Ms. Kirkmeyer. I, I just want to clarify something for Dr. Lewis, um, just to go back, because I, I know what path you are going down, so I, I want to help you with some of the language, because I'm, I'm not sure it was clearly explained. So the, the, if you look on the page where the language is, I want to show you what they can do, because it is changing. So I don't want you to get the idea that it isn't changing. So it, it basically, and it's not just the definition of immediately available. So. It says, right now in existing law, it says a physician assistant may also act as a first or second assistant in surgery under the supervision of an approved supervising physician. So that's what current law is. What the amendment is to now add is that they may, the physician assistant may so act without the personal presence of the supervising physician in the su if the supervising physician is immediately available to the physician assistant and then it goes on to define that define immediately available so there is a difference in procedure it may be happening today but as far as how the regulation reads right now it reads that the person can do it but it, the way it reads, it sounds like the physician has to be there the way it reads. So what they're recommending the change is, is the, to clarify that the supervising <coughs> physician doesn't have to be personally present there. So they don't have to be standing beside the individual as they do that, but they can now um, be immediately available, which means they have to be returned to the patient without delay upon request, et cetera. So I don't want you to get the idea that this isn't quite changing the way it was seen before because it actually does. So, so that's the difference, Dr. Lewis. Does that help out a little bit in the difference in what it does? With your explanation, now it does. Okay, all right. I didn't have that before to understand okay. that. Yeah, one day. Question for Dr. Kraus. Is there a conflict in terminology in saying that one can be an assistant surgeon uh, when the primary surgeon is not in the room. Um, I've been an assistant surgeon in many cases, and in my cases, uh, the primary surgeon has always been in the room. But we have a circumstance where PAs are utilized where the primary surgeon is not, only, not always in the room, but we're saying by definition that the physician assistant acts as a first or second assistant. So can you be an assistant when the primary is not in the room? Is there a contradiction there? It, I can answer that. Actually, it, the, it's not the entire procedure, but you have to be in the room in the most important part of the procedure, and it happens quite often in cardiac surgery. 
Usually a resident opens the chest. Cardiac surgeon comes in there at that time and uh, does the most important part of the operation. And then the assistant, the resident, closes the chest. So when the chest was opened, cardiac surgeon probably is not in the room. And it's very common. So it is the team. Uh, you are assisting as part of the team. So that's why I think this clarifies better than what it was, what was <coughs> happening already. So this is happening now, but the language is not clear. In my mind, this clears it. <coughs> Dr. Yip. Dr. Yip. I think, <coughs> I think that it's good to clarify um, just that like a lot of the medicine, 99% is good, 1% can cause problem. I mean, the language I'm not opposing, but also just to be critical, I'm glad the PA has a board that they can do whatever to protect the profession. But you want to know some of the situation in the hospital, let's say some hospital really try to reinforce the surgeon and the assistant be in the room when they're closing the fashion, when they're closing the wound, to give time to the nurse to do count. And oftentimes some surgeon and assistant don't obey that, and they're very hard to reinforce. So PA is good to be there, but on the other hand, I'm also concerned when you read it, the language as if the PA can do, let's say, not the cardiac surgeon as a team, let's say closing a colectomy, and the surgeon is, is out there before the fascia is closed, and they say employee, employee relationship. I'm not sure how good the PA can, hey, boss, I need you to come back here. I mean, sometimes they may get in the situation that they want to offend the board, the boss, and then try to do something, and our patient will be jeopardized. But I'm not opposing language, I'm just saying that for the purpose of our non-MD, non-surgeon member, there is a problem that I can force in the future. I, if I may, I'll, I'll let Mr. Sachs speak to this too, but my, my initial impression with the PA board is that that sort of behavior, if a PA did not call in, any, in a prompt fashion, that they would take immediate and significant action, that there would be no tolerance for that sort of behavior, at least my impression of the way the PA board functions. They, they have a very strong sense of pride in their profession and strongly want to discipline any uh, malpracticing PAs, perhaps even more so than we do, if that's possible. They're, they're very strict. That's so why I'm glad to hear the yeah. board is there to protect them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, um, I also they, want to say one thing. To, I'm not sure if, it's, if there's much difference between a middle-level resident in residency and a PA because the standard of care, as I've seen it, and I believe it's, it's fine because my hospital is very strict on this, is very frequently a surgeon will be running two rooms and they'll, they'll uh, do the, the major portion of the procedure, but they'll move on to the second room while the mid-level resident's closing the, the tissues of the, of the leg, for example. It's very common in orthopedic, so I presume it's legal. Don't think I'm letting the cat out of the bag, and I think it's safe. Um, so I, I, I think it's already happening, and I'm not sure how much differentiation there is there. I would suggest that many PAs are much more facile than some of the mid-level residents I've seen. So um, just to add that little tidbit of information. Any other comments, questions, comments from members of the so board? So what I'm understanding from this is it's a clarification of language of what is the existing community standard of practice. Is that correct? Is that what we would, we're not making any major no. There's no new ground being, you guys already exist, correct? Basically, we already do it. <laughs> I'm just not uh, sure after Whether or not we're, it's happening within the it's regulation. Happening. What happened was, uh, it, I've been around, unfortunately, way too long, but in 1991, when we wrote our regulations, which are still in existence, we did not define personal presence. We did that on purpose. Uh, in 2005, APA requested an opinion from the DCA on personal presence. That opinion was written by Mr. Hepler, who was concerned that the PA would be uh, in the operating room without the supervising physician with the patient under a general anesthetic, and that the patient responsibility of being under the general anesthetic fell on the part of the primary surgeon. I tried to convince Mr. Hepler that there is an anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist in the room who is responsible for the general anesthetic. The PA and the surgeon have nothing to do with it. So they defined this opinion as earshot and eyeshot. It was an opinion 
but it is on the wall in every operating room in California. So it's the standard of care currently, correct? Mm -hmm. The standard of care is that a physician <coughs> needs to be in the room according to the opinion. Thank you. Ms. Shipsky. Well, I was just going to point out that um, there are also RNFAs, which are registered nurse first assistants, and they do the very same thing. They're the first surgical assistants with the, uh, in the operating room. They're not as used extensively, uh, but they're being used more and more. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now turn to comments from members of the public. I have one, yes. one slip um, from Teresa Anderson, who's waited patiently all day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Teresa Anderson, Public Policy Director for California Academy of Physician Assistants. And this issue is a significant issue for many of our members. Um, we urge for regulatory change and um, ask that there at least be a regulatory hearing where we can gather and um, get interested parties to the table. And I, I know, you know, it's kind of the second, maybe third time around for this issue, um, but we, we really do need to address it and um, work on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have before us a motion. Any other public comments? Oh, sorry. Sorry, any other public comments? Okay, we have before us a motion. Do you want to restate the motion, Dr. Bishop, which is, I believe, okay. to proceed to uh, an interested party? Consider the regulatory proposal and direct staff to begin the rulemaking process to adopt the proposed language. Right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'll abstain. One abstention. I'm going to abstain as well. Abstain, Two abstentions. Abstain bug. Abstain bug. Abstain. Do I have an accurate count? Is there anyone else? Okay, thank you. Great. Um, I think now we're going to um, recess until tomorrow morning at 8.30 in the morning.